What are your thoughts in the UK about the woke society? Big question, man. I've made this point a few times and I'll say it again. I think that we have- Zuby. He's a Britain, rapper. Yeah. Host of Real Talk with Zuby podcast, the author of Strong Advice. Public speaker. Won the world championships <laughs> in women's <laughs> powerlifting. I identified as a woman whilst lifting the weight. Don't be a bigot. 2019, it popped. Yeah. Joe Rogan probably changed your life. Yeah, definitely. I've now at this point met a lot of, you know, famous, prominent, successful people. Andrew Tate, Elon. Did he mention anything in that conversation, a topic you're like, my God, that has just sent me to another level. I love a lot of what Elon has done. I am genuinely concerned about Neuralink. How do you program ethics and morality into an AI? What if we had an ultimate AI and it decided we don't need people? There are thousands of people out there, possibly millions, who have a very, very distorted view of who I am. Why do you think that? Because... Zuby, welcome to the show, mate. How's it going, Dodge? Happy to be here. Yeah, mate. Really looking forward to this one. We've known each other quite a while, and it's lovely to have you back here in sunny Bournemouth. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be back. We used to see each other in what used to be Fitness First. That's right. Queen's Park. I think that would have been over a decade ago now. Yeah. Well yeah. over a decade ago, yeah, actually. Yeah. And um, I think that's where we first got got chatting, and then eventually I got involved with uh, Bournemouth Sevens Festival. And that's right. Yeah, we've been through. Been for a lot. Uh, yeah, a lot, actually. Yeah. A lot. Amazing. Amazing. And you are smashing America. My God. Smashing the world. <laughs> smashing the world is unbelievable. Love watching your journey. But let's, let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you end up smashing America? Okay. So I'll give the, I'll give the abbreviated version. Hmm. So my name is Zuby, independent rapper, author, host of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast, speaker and coach. I work with a lot of different people. I was born in the UK, in Luton, to be precise, for anyone who's curious. I actually grew up in Saudi Arabia. I moved there when I was a baby at the age of one. And I went to school there from preschool up until fifth grade. So fifth grade, age 11. When I was 11 years old, I actually went to boarding school here in the UK. Um, I went to a school in Surrey, and then I was in Bristol for five years. So during that whole period of my life, from 11 to 20, I was still living in Saudi Arabia, but I was going to school or university in the UK. So I was back and forth, traveling by myself internationally from the age of 11, flying back and forth between the two countries. And so anyone who's curious about my, my accent, which always confuses people, whether, <laughs> whether I'm in the UK or I'm in the US, people are confused. They're like, wait, is he British? Is he yeah. American? What is he? So I'm British, but um, yeah, I went to an American school for a while. I went to both the American and British school systems. So it's kind of mixed up. My family background is originally from Nigeria. Both my parents are originally from Nigeria. And um, after I, I, you know, I did very well in school. Uh, you know, aced my GCSEs and A-levels, got into Oxford University. I studied computer science, and that is also where I first started rapping. So I released my first album when I was in my second year of university. It was an independent album called Commercial Underground. So that was what how I first got involved in the music world. So I used to go out on the weekends and sell my CDs on the street. I used to start, I started out just doing it in Oxford. Then one summer, I think this would have been summer... 2007 i started traveling to london and i used to actually sell my cds in leicester square specifically leicester square piccadilly circus area and then i graduated university in 2007 wow doesn't seem that long oh, no, ago I now say, yeah yeah uh, i took out a year and did my music full-time for a year i released a second album called the unknown celebrity and i just started touring and traveling around the whole uk this is when people may have first seen me way back in the day in Bournemouth Square, selling my CDs there or on, you know, outside West Quay in Southampton. I was just traveling all over the UK, talking to people on the street, just selling CDs out of my backpack. After that, I... I just want to hold you Go there. ahead. Okay. Because everyone who knew you from Bournemouth or around the area saw you every day on the streets, chatting to people, selling CDs, yep. all in your mauve purple gear with Zuby, and people didn't really understand what who you were and what you were doing. Yeah. Did you know something back then that other people <laughs> didn't? Because you just mentioned there the celebrity. Yeah. And we're talking 10 years ago. Did uh, you more, have, more than 10. More than 10. But more do you have something in the back of your mind going, I'm going to be massive one day. Watch this space. Absolutely. Yeah, this is 15 years ago. I released The Unknown Celebrity in 2008. Commercial Underground 2006, Unknown Celebrity 2008. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, I would not have been able to. I mean, let me continue the story yeah. first of yeah, all because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. important. So in 2008, I moved to London and I started working a, a corporate job. I used to actually be a management consultant. So I worked with one of the big consultancy firms for three years, 2008 to 2011. And then I was doing my music stuff on the side. So I was juggling two careers at this point. And then I got to a point in 2011 where they were really starting to conflict with each other. And my progress in music was being limited by my corporate job and all my moonlighting as a rapper was starting to interfere with, uh, with you know, my quote unquote real job. And so at the beginning of 2011, I made a decision that by the end of that year, I was going to be a full-time rapper. And if I make a decision, I do it. I'm mm -hmm. not someone who flip-flops on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Like I'm very committed to my decisions. So in September, September or October, 2011, I handed my notice and I left that job. And that is when I became a full-time rapper. This is when I went like full steam with just being all over the country, doing independent tours, being out there in all the different city centers, talking to anyone who would listen, selling my CDs. That was how I made, selling my CDs on the street was how I made my primary income from 2011 until 2014. Mm. In 2014, I graduated off the street and I started doing my pop-up shops. So you may have seen me in West Key, yeah. in um, what, the Oracle in Reading, in Whiteleys in London, in some of the Intu shopping centers around the country. So from 2014 to early 2019, mm. January 2019, my primary source of income was still selling my CDs out there, but primarily in shopping centers. And I also had a, I had my whole shop, so I'd also sell my t-shirts, my hats, my hoodies. I used to have my own line of headphones, all of that. So just full on grind mode, basically from 2011 up until early 2019. So that period then when you were selling CDs, obviously CDs were getting washed out by then. Yeah. What so, was making you think, right, I'm going to earn a living out of making CDs? What was, the, mm -hmm. there was something behind just the CD and getting yourself out there? Yeah. So if you were to think about it, so when I released my very first album on CD, that was 2006. Okay. So the world has changed a lot since 2006, <laughs> right? We're talking pre iPhone, we're talking yeah. pre streaming, we're pre talking media. pre social, yeah, yeah, social media in its earliest incarnation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I joined Facebook actually in 2004, so I've been on there almost 20 years, which is mm. insane mm. to even think about. 2004? 2004, wow, I joined Wow, what Facebook. did it come to like the UK in not 2007? So you have to remember, I went to Oxford University. That was the first university in the country that it opened up to. So right? you remember when Facebook started, it was just for Harvard. Yes, right? so they've targeted and the two then, big ones. And then it expanded to the okay. Ivy League colleges in the US, and then it was brought to Oxford and Cambridge. Yeah. So I, I will be like in the first 0.01% yeah. of people on Facebook. I've been on Facebook for ages. And yeah. this is back in the MySpace days as well. I used to, MySpace was the biggest social yeah. media at the platform at the time. Yeah. So things have really changed. I've been through like a lot of iterations. So I've seen the, I mean, I mean we, we talked about streaming. Mm. In 2006, iTunes wasn't even big. Mm. iTunes download store. So we've been through the, the CD phase and then downloading, and now things have moved into streaming. And I've kind of just been there independently riding the wave and keeping myself alive throughout this thing. So early 2019, and this is a very, in, this is a very important part. So the very last pop-up shop I ever did yeah. was in Derby, into Derby. Anyone in the UK, you may be familiar with that shopping center. It's in the Midlands. And I was standing at my store it was actually the very first, so I used to run the pop-up shops with my, my good friend Shouto, who's also an independent rapper. And this was the first shop that I was doing without him because he was busy doing some other stuff. And I was standing at the store and I was, it, it was in the morning, it was like 9 a.m., mall had just opened, no customers yet. And I'm standing there thinking at this point, you know, I'm, man, I'm more than a decade into this journey. I'm almost f five years into standing around in shopping malls, talking to strangers and selling my stuff like this. They're thinking, man, what's the next, what's the next move? I graduated from the street to the shopping centers and I'm not getting rained on anymore. That's great. But, you know, a year from now, five years from now, I, st I don't still want to be physically standing here mm -hmm. having to talk to thousands of strangers every week in order to make a living and get my name out there. And so I was there, you know, in my brain thinking of all these different ideas. As I'm doing this, I'm scrolling through Twitter. I'm scrolling through Twitter and um, I, I see two different stories about 
males beating females in their sports. I saw two different stories coming out of some high school in the, I think two different high schools in the USA. And I was just like, this is dumb. Like this mm. is, this is ridiculous, right? And then I was like, I wonder what the British women's deadlift record is. Like you've seen me in the gym. Like, Mate, you're oh, a strong yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, out of curiosity, yeah. I was just like, man, this is silly. And what so, was it? I, mean, I think it was 215 kilos okay, okay. in the 84 kg weight class. Yeah. So I was like, hmm, I can do 275. <laughs> And I was, I, on my phone, uh, I had a video of me pulling 230. Yeah. Just just a little video I'd had yeah. from one of my training sessions. So That's strong, mate. Even 230 strong. What were you, you weighing in at? Uh, at the time, about 83. 84. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 83. I, I know I did 275 at 83. I, I, I saw you in the gym when we used to train. Yeah. And I remember what you were pulling one day and the bar was bent like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> strong, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I used to pull. I used to train with over 250 yeah. sometimes. And... Um, so at this time, to, to give people the proper reference, this is February 26, 2019. At this point, I am more than 13 years into launching my first album and eight years into myself being a full-time musician and entrepreneur. And grafting the streets. And grafting the streets, yeah. right? At this time, I have I had 18,000 followers on Twitter, mm. one eight, and I had across all the platforms combined 50,000 followers. Okay. So this is the beginning of 2019. So I just had this video. I really did not think that much of it. I, so I, I took the video and I wrote a tweet and I wrote, I keep hearing about how biological men have no strength advantage over women in 2019. So watch me destroy the British women's deadlift record without trying. P.S. I identified as a woman whilst lifting the weight. Don't be a bigot. That was it. <laughs> tweet. Nine second video. I remember. Nine second video. <laughs> Within minutes... I knew something was happening. I didn't know. I, I've never seen. This was this was my first time having a truly viral tweet. I've had hundreds at this point now, but when I say viral, I mean in real time. The numbers were just going up. Like as I'm looking at the phone, give me an example. It's it's just the retweets are just going five, eight, twelve, twenty, thirty, thirty-five, forty, fifty-two. See, it it was just going up. Like I'm I'm looking at my phone. And I'm like, what is happening? Within within 10 minutes, the video had about 10,000 views. Yeah. Within 10 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I only had 18,000 followers. Yeah. It's not like a million yeah, plus yeah, like yeah. I have now. And I'm just like, what is happening? <laughs> and so I, I'm there at my shop. Like I'm, I'm just running my day as usual. And I keep looking back at this tweet and I'm like, what is happening? And it just kept, it was just, it, it was crazy. It just kept going. And by the time I went to bed that night, 300,000 views. I wake up in the morning, half a million. Later that day, it hits 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. And then I start getting emails. <laughs> I start getting emails from, the, hello, I'm so-and-so from BBC. We'd like to talk to you about this. Oh, hey, I'm so-and-so from Fox News. We just saw your tweet about this. And we don't. And so I just started getting all of these media organizations mm -hmm. reaching out to me, wanting to talk about, talk about this thing. It's, I think the timing of it yes. and the way that I'd framed it and the video and everything and the humor behind it, it just hit this intersection of yeah. all these different worlds. So the post went viral within the world of sport. Mm. It went viral within the world of entertainment. It went viral in the world of politics. It went viral in all these different spaces. It just, it just, it, it, it was very weird. And so I started getting the opportunity to go on radio shows and then podcasts and this and that. And people wanted to talk to me about this particular thing. You know, why, why, why did you do this? What was the point you were trying to make? What are your thoughts on this and that? So it gave me the platform to just be seen by and share my thoughts and views mm. with new audiences. Mm. And so beyond the original humor on, of the issue I was pointing at, it sort of showed people, oh, okay. It, it was like, or for people to discover everything else, right? So then people were like, oh, cool. I, if you even look on the comments in some of my YouTube videos, you'll see, came for the deadlift, stayed for the music, yeah. right? Or, you know, <laughs> right? So, 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 so people managed to, you know, people discovered my music. By this time, I'd started my podcast. Yeah. I just started my podcast January 2019. Yeah. Mid-2019, I also wrote and released my first book, Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. So over the course of these weeks, the, the, the tweet was going viral for weeks. I had 20,000 followers, mm. 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. My, my audience just kept on growing. Um, and then a few weeks into this, I wake up one morning and uh, my phone is going crazy. 
And I was just, I just see Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, Joe. I was like, what's going on? And someone's like, dude, Joe Rogan just mentioned you on his podcast. Like, Joe. He bigs you up massively as well, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, he does. And, and, and remember, this is when uh, his show was on YouTube as well, yeah. right? Before the Spotify exclusive. Yeah. So the clips used to actually have a, an even wider reach. Yeah. And so I'm like, what's going on? And so I go and I listen to his his episode that had come out. And yeah, there's a two minute section with him Amazing. and Brian Callen and they're, they're talking about it. And then he started following me on Twitter. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And so I, I'm there and suddenly chatting with Joe Rogan in the DMs. And then I just I, I, would, I just came up tons of people's radar. Piers Morgan did something on it. Tucker Carlson, like most listen, one of the most listened to people in the USA, did a segment on it on his, on his show that used to be on Fox News. And so fast forward a few months and um, I got invited to do uh, Dave Rubin's show, The Rubin Report. He was in LA at the time. Joe Rogan was in LA at, at the time. Ben Shapiro and The Daily Wire were in LA at the time. So I knew I was going to be going to Los Angeles for the first time. And so I messaged Joe and I just said, hey, uh, Dave, Dave's invited me to do his show. You know, if I'd love to, if you'd be, ha if you'd be happy to, you know, it'd be an honor to be on your podcast. And he just wrote, he just wrote back, you know, F yeah. <laughs> Uh, Quality. and I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. So now I've got the Ruben report lined up. I've got the Joe Rogan experience lined up. And so I flew out to LA in September and I only thought I'd be in the States for a couple of weeks. I ended up staying three months. Wow. So I flew to LA first. I did those shows. And then the daily wire guys reached out and said, Hey, Ben Shapiro wants to have you on a one hour Sunday special. And so now I'm sitting down with Ben Shapiro and then this person reaches out and that person. And so I was in LA, then I went to San Francisco, Dallas, Austin, DC, New York. I got invited to the White House. I got invited to the Pentagon. I got it Wait, was, dude, this it, is like you could you couldn't write this. You couldn't write it, could you? It was this it is was, brilliant. It was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Um and, and, and you have to keep in mind as well, this is September. So this is, you know, half September twenty nineteen. Yeah, yeah. So this is half a year after I've yeah. actually posted this deadlift thing. But that like I said, that just opened the doors. It was sort of a catalyst for other people just to discover me as a speaker, as a musician, as an overall communicator, as someone who's just sharing his ideas and thoughts with the world. Mm. And honestly, I didn't know how valued that would be. Mm. Now we are here in July, 2023, as, as we record this. So several years later, and I've been quite astonished with everything I've done between then and now just how much appetite and interest there is in me just sharing my honest perspectives on what I see in the world, what I see happening in society, in culture, my thoughts on mindset, on just all these different things. I found myself in a lot of rooms with a lot of different people all over the world um, who on paper, it might seem like, you know, what do, what do these people even have in common? Yeah. How is this person here? How's this person there? And it's been um it's been quite a wild ride dodge mm -hmm. and um as you said if i go back to those days of me selling my cd's on the street i knew i would reach this level but i didn't know it was going to happen this way i always thought it was going to yeah. just be primarily through the vehicle of my music yeah um cuz that was what i was so focused on but you know as they say god works in mysterious ways mm -hmm. and i've been able to use my voice to reach people through a range of different mediums mm -hmm. books podcasts on stage music, whatever it is. And as long as people are hearing my message and I'm able to influence and inspire people in a positive direction, then that's totally on track with what my goal has always been, which is to positively inspire and uplift millions of people mm. through my words. And so it's gone beyond just the music, mm. but the actual mission has not changed at all from when I was out there selling my love CDs it. on the street. Absolutely love it. What year did you finish Oxford University? 2007. So 2007 to 2019, apart from your sort of three years in corporate world, you were mm -hmm. grafting the streets, yep. chatting to people, selling seeds. What sort of money were you earning a day on that? Because that's, uh, that's full on graft. That's, yeah. that's you know, that's, <laughs> I, I remember seeing you on the streets, mate. You're chatting to yeah. everyone that moved and you're going to get a lot of knockbacks, a lot of knockbacks oh, yeah. and you're going to get a lot of love. <clears throat> and they are the biggest gifts that someone can ever have is yes. to be a good communicator on the streets. I, I had 10 years on the streets yep. flyering for them. One, I had 12 nightclubs every week around the country on the streets chatting. You've got a minute, 60 seconds to chat to someone mm -hmm. to get them to convince them to get into your nightclub and not another nightclub. Yep. It's the same thing with you. How did you take knockbacks? I viewed it as part of the process. Yeah. I viewed it as part of the process. Um, and in terms of knockbacks, 
I mean, I even knew what the statistics were because I spoke to so many hundreds mm. of thousands of people. Mm. I must have spoken to at least half a million people mm. if I actually do the math on it because mm. I sold 30,000 CDs. And how much a CD? Um, I was doing them between five and 10 pounds, okay. depending on which one it was and, and so on. Was there a figure that if you went into Bournemouth town or you went into yeah. Seventh, or you went so are you going, right, I need to earn a couple of hundred pounds a day, 300 pounds. What was it for you? Well, every day of the week was quite different, mm. right? So my expectations on a Monday or Tuesday yeah. were quite different to a Friday or Saturday. It also massively depended on the city. So I went to over, I've been to over 40, yeah. uh, no, over, over 50 different cities yeah. doing this everywhere from Glasgow yeah. to the, I've been down to the Isle of Wight yeah. to Glasgow from Swansea to Norwich and yeah. pretty much everywhere in the middle, any city that I could think of. And um, so I remember my record, the best I ever did one day in Liverpool, I sold 68. CDs in one day. I remember that was my record. Um, but on a typical day, I so that's sixty eight roughly. If we said it was a, a ten, as say if it's seven quid, say five hundred yeah, quid. I made about five hundred quid okay. that day. Yeah, okay. I, but that that was like my best day ever. But that's a lot of graft for five hundred quid. I want to know yeah. what you had in the back of your mind, mm. knowing that you are grafting. Because I just, yeah. to, for you to go to all these different cities, mm -hmm. knowing you got to get your travel, you got to be motivated. Yes, Do you know, it's not as if like you were in a nightclub, you know, and every person coming in is three or four quid. Yeah. You might speak to hundred people, and mm -hmm. one may buy. Yeah, my so to give you actual numbers. Yeah, I would say that about one in three people would stop. Yeah, and about one in three people who stopped would buy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Typically. It yeah. could vary. Um, you know, I'd have days where, man, I, you know, I was 50% of people who would stop would buy. I had days where, you know, I did try to talk to 15 people to get one to stop. It really depended on where I was. You found actually each city was very different. So I'd have favorite cities. Yeah. Um, so on a good day, I'd sell, I'd be very happy if I sold like 25 plus, 20 25 plus CDs yep. would generally be like a successful day. Sometimes you'd only hit 18. So a ton 50 know. to 200 pound a day. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd typically aim to make 100 pounds profit. Okay. You know, if it took me, if it cost me 30 pounds to get to a city and then I made, you know, 130, 150 quid, then I'd typically consider that a pretty good day. What was the ultimate goal? Like you've, you, you're an intelligent guy. Yeah. You've gone to boarding school. Your mum and dad have given you a very good upbringing. <laughs> Respect yeah. to your mum and dad because they brought up a wonderful boy. Thank you. You've traveled the world back and forth. You've been very independent. Mm -hmm. You went to Oxford Uni to do computer science. That's yep. super intelligent to do that. Sorry. But for you to then go on the street and say, I want to be a rapper. Yeah. Did you see like some big vision that you were going to be on the international <laughs> stage as a rapper? And did you know what sort of sums of money you could be earning if you hit the jackpot? Yeah. Um, to this day, what I do has never been primarily money driven. No. If it was, I wouldn't have left my corporate job. This is something that a lot of people didn't understand. I took a massive pay hit. I'll tell you something, Dodge. I left my job in October 2011. Hmm. It wasn't until 20, 2019 or 2020 was the first year where I made more money than I used to make. Yeah at my job, mm. right? So there were people who thought, oh, like, you know, people who don't understand the world mm. of music, they thought, oh, you know, you're leaving your corporate job to, you know, oh, you know, you're, you're gonna go and you're doing this for the money somehow. Mm. I was like, dude, if I wanted to make money, I'd stay working in London, I'd stay mm. working in, but you'd in the city. But you'd be piss bored working in the city yeah. as a corporate with your hands tied. Do you know how I really, yeah. made, do you know how I really made the decision? So I, I would have been around 24 or so at the time when I left. How old are you today? I'm 36. 36 okay. So I was looking at, so, so given the kind of corporate environment I worked in, I was one of the youngest people, mm. right? Um, I'm there in my early to mid 20s. A lot of the people I'm working with are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s. And I simply was like, do I want to be Stuck. like that <laughs> in tw 20 yeah. years, 20 yeah. years from now? Yeah. Do I want to be this person? And the resounding answer was no, yeah. I don't, right? You know, no, no discredit to anybody, mm. but I know how I'm wired, I know what talents I have, I know what my sort of wider vision for the world is and the impact I wanna make on it. And I was like, I cannot do that mm. in this environment. Like I, ju I just can't, you know, I can be secure and have a solid salary, but no one's gonna remember me. Yeah. I'm not gonna be able to inspire anyone yeah. or motivate anyone. I'm a creative person, I like to create, I like to write, I like to make music, I like to perform. And I, I can't, it's, it's like a lion in a zoo. Yeah. You know, like the lion can stay in the zoo, but he's never going to live the life of yeah. a lion that's out there in the plains. Mm. You know, it might be, it might feel safe. It mm. might feel, seem secure, you know, and it might be more normal to some people, but it's like, nah, you want to run out there and uh, take the adventure.
What did your mom and dad think? Good question. That's a great question. God bless my parents. They got it. They understood me. They got it, did they? They understood me. And I give them super extra credit for that because in the part of the world that we're originally from, you know, both uh, African and Asian parents have a reputation yeah. <laughs> for always wanting their kids to do, you know, you're going to be a doctor, you're yeah, going to be a lawyer, right. you're going to yeah, be yeah, an yeah, accountant yeah, yeah. and yeah. so on. But with my parents, even before I went full time with my music, they, they've always, they always supported me. Mm. They always supported me. Every single album I've released to this day, any book that I put out, any physical product I make, my mom will always be the first person to buy it. Yeah. If I release a new t-shirt, my mom wants to be the first person yeah. with it. In fact, one time... What's she, your mom's name? Uh, Chica. Wow. Massive yeah. shout out to Chica. <laughs> yeah. One, one time she got a little mad at my dad because I, I don't know if it was my last album or the one before it, but my dad bought a copy before she did. <laughs> and uh, she Compared wasn't... Yeah. Mom and dad. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. So they literally want to be the first and they want to pay for it too. They don't want me to give them the free CD. Was, they want to pay for it. Was there ever a time in that period from that... 2011 to 2019, you think things aren't really happening for me. I'm on an undercredit day. Things aren't happening. What's going on? My numbers yeah. of social media not going on. Is it going to work out for me? Am I taking the wrong route? Am I mm. taking too much of a gamble? That must have been spinning. Dude, absolutely. Yeah. Because I, I, the thing with selling on the street or even in the shopping centers is it's very much mm. up and down. Mm. Even in the course of a day, you can have like an hour where you're on fire, right? And everyone, everyone's buying. There's so much interest. And then you can have a one hour, two hour period where it's just dead. You're trying to talk to people. Every people are ignoring you. You're, you just like, you know, or, or it's raining or it's snowing. I mean, I used to sell my CD. The British weather is not yeah, great. Yeah, that's right. British weather is not great, right? And I'm, I'm 300 there. days of rain and snow. <laughs> it's a little gap. Oh, yeah, I'll be there, you know, because yeah. one of the busiest periods would be Christmas, of yeah. course, right? The yeah. run up to Christmas. And I used to be out there outside in the cold, you know, two degrees, three degrees, whatever it is you know, selling CDs to Christmas shoppers and so on. And in the back of my mind, especially at the time, once I've gone full time, you know, I might, I'm literally, I remember a day I'm like, I'm in Newcastle. It's snowing. It's snowing. <laughs> That's like where snow all the girls is... wear mini skirts <laughs> in Christmas, isn't it? And yeah. Just, high heels. <laughs> yeah. It's snowing <laughs> and it's a Tuesday and, you know, obviously not a lot of people are stopping and buying. And I'm like, man, I used to, a year before this time, I was sitting in a, you know, in a cushy desk mm. in London, you know, earning decent money, just like doing my job and being a normal person. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, why, why am I putting myself through this? But in the back of my mind and in my heart and in my gut, I always knew that this is a necessary stepping stone for something much bigger. My, my aspiration was never, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be out here in the street in 20 years mm. and I'm still gonna be doing the same thing. No, but I'm so glad I went through that process also for, for so many reasons, so many reasons, because almost nobody has met half a million people, mm. right? I, mean, talk to, I talk to people now and people are like, man, dude, how are you, how are you so good at communicating? How are you so good at speaking and getting your words across? Mm. I'm like, dude, do you know how much I've practiced? Yeah. Do, you, do you know how much I have talked? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I've spent decades you. at this yeah. point just talking to people, yeah. all sorts of people, different, nice different it, ages to strangers as well. But what a, what so, a delight. We, we've yeah. both speaken, spoken to hundreds of thousands of people uh -huh. and we both now have our own podcast. Yes. Stream. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, same. I love, love it. people. And, but, and then Good an, for you, another, Thank you, man. Good thank you. you. Yeah. And, and then, you know, another question I get asked a lot is, oh, you know, how do you, how do you deal with the hate? How do you deal with the pushback? How mm. do you... Dude, do you know how many people have said no to me? Yeah. Do you know how many times I've been ignored? Yeah. Hundreds of thousands yeah. of people have ignored me or said no to me. Or, you know, even when you're out there, sometimes some, some people are nasty. Like some people mm. will straight up put you down, you know, mm. oh, go get a real job, man. Like, yeah. you know, what are you doing out here? Um, and so. Did you uh, ever bite? Did like, you ever bite when someone was rude to you on the street? Or do you, did you bite your tongue, walk away, carry on with life? Hmm. I think there were there were a couple times where I checked people, not in a not in an aggressive manner, but you know if someone went out of their way to be like unnecessarily rude or you know make a very unnecessary comment, um, I had ones which I just let slide. But then I had times where you know where I, I wouldn't you know square up yeah. to someone and confront them yeah. or anything, but you know just kind of call them out on it. Ask them why. Yeah, call them out on it. And and to be honest, most people, you know, I think sometimes people say something and they don't really they don't really realize what they're mm. doing or saying. So actually, I, you know, I had situations where people actually apologized. I had situations where someone said something and then they actually came back later in the day to apologize to me. Lovely. 
and we're like, yeah, actually, man, I'm, That's respect. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Like I, I didn't, you know, I was, and, and I, I also understand like people, you don't know what's going on with people, yeah. out, right? Anyone who walk into any city center, you see people walking around and busy. You, you don't know what's going on in right. their life. You don't know. Maybe they've been fighting with their girlfriend. Yeah. Maybe they've just been fired. You, you don't know what's going yeah. on with people. Right. Yeah. So I'd always offer people that grace of just mm. like, okay, look, you know, Sometimes someone might be a bit rude or a bit curt or whatever, but I don't know. Like they could have stuff going on in the life. They could be rushing to, I don't know. Right? I think you've been working in the quantum level. You've been working <laughs> in the quantum level, probably not even realizing. In fact, you probably do, did realize it for all those years, yeah. knowing something was going to pop. 2019, it popped. Yeah. Joe Rogan probably changed your life. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, there have been so many, so many, look, I want to, firstly, I want to say thank you to everyone. Yeah. E literally, everyone who's bought, everyone who bought one of my CDs on yeah. the street or in the shopping center, anyone who's been to a gig, bought a t-shirt, sent me a positive DM, supported in any way, you know, all the people who we've got big platforms and have invited me on to be on their shows or whatever it is. I'm genuinely grateful for all, everyone who has supported me. Mm. And one thing I truly love about my journey is I know who they are. Yeah. You know what I mean? I actually love the fact that I didn't just that that I haven't just sort of popped up out of nowhere and kind of just blown up yeah. because some someone has you know shoved millions of pounds into marketing me or whatever. It's been very slow mm. and very organic. Yeah. So it's at, at the same time it's been very real, mm. right? It's like cool. I've actually been able to meet so many of these people and you know thank people one by one constantly. The, the my most commonly said phrase in any day, every single day for the past. 15 years. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. DM. Oh, Zubi, I love what you're doing. I love listening to your podcast. Thanks, man. Thank I, appreciate I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Same. I appreciate it. It's nice, Constantly. isn't it? I love, yeah. It's and nice to, it's nice to be nice. Also nice to go out of your way to thank or leave a little voice note to yeah. random people who send you beautiful messages. Yeah. That takes a second. Yeah. All the time. But, so. it, but those seconds don't half add up when you've got loads of messages coming in. It, but, it all adds yeah, up, man. But yeah. you know, I don't, one of the biggest changes I'd say in my life over the last couple of years has been it's completely inverted from the problem being not having enough opportunities mm. to having so many, having too many and not being able. What do you say yes to? What yeah. do you say no to? You've got so many people wanting your attention mm. from all over the world, all these directions, and you now have to be more judicious and careful about how you manage it all. But the problem used to be the complete opposite. I'm there trying to get people to pay yeah. attention to me. Hey, like, look, yeah. this is who I am. I'm Zuby. Here's what it is. And now it's like people are coming to you. Hey, can you do this for me? Hey, can you do this? I've got this show. Can you come? Can you do? Yeah. And I'm like, man, um, but I, I do my best to never complain about it yeah. because I'm like, hey, this is what I was working for yeah. all those years. Yeah. This is what this is what I wanted. Have you got a team or is it just you? To this day. <laughs> It's really still just me. Yeah. I have uh, I have one person. I have an assistant. Shout out to May in the Philippines who helps me with some of my podcast scheduling yeah. and uh, you know descriptions and stuff like that and uploads some of the, the technical parts of it. And then um, I've got um, an assistant who helps me with some YouTube stuff named Ronell. He's he's over in New York. So those are the only two people. Wow. Uh, so they're both like part time. But apart from that, it, to this day, it's still it's still just me. Mm. And that's not even out of a matter of pride, per se. It's just that it's it's all it's only quite recently where I've even felt that a team would be useful. Yeah. Right. From 2006 all the way up to now, it's just been yeah. Zuby solo dolo doing my thing. And I've also learned so much in it. Right. So I know how to do so many different things like mm. i i can do 15 different mm. jobs and i can actually do them pretty quickly because i've just been doing it for such a yeah. long time people come to me oh who designed your website i'm like me who who who, 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 who did that thing i'm like me who handles yeah. your bookings me yeah. like who do i email if i me right and i know the normal thing is to to have a team um and i think for me that will naturally come come around somewhat organically but um yeah there there is no it's actually funny. One of the biggest compliments I get is that there are there are many people out there who think I've got like some big machine behind mm. me, right? They see all the things I'm doing and achieving, and he's he's getting on this show and he's on that and he's on TV and he's doing. And they're like, man, he must have a. Mm. I, I get people who are like, man, you must have you must have a great team or like your your branding team or your PR team. I'm like, I don't have one. Yeah, like it's it's me. Like if you, I how how did you get Elon Musk on your podcast? I asked him. Yeah, like what who did you go through? Like I. 
emailed him, mm. uh, DM'd him, even, yeah. right? like, you know, like it's, it's all very personal. What it's, was, uh, what was Joe Rogan like when he went on his show? What's he like as a bloke? He's exactly the same. Yeah. He is completely the same. If you, if you listen to a lot of his shows mm. um, and you're familiar with how he is, he is completely like that in real life. Um, and I can say that actually about a lot of the people I've now at this point met a lot of, you know, famous, prominent, successful people, people, and the vast, vast majority are just how, how they seem, yeah. um, you know, genuine, humble, friendly, polite, funny, mm. um, you know, just, just amiable, mm. just amiable. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm the same. I don't, I don't, there's one Zuby, yeah. you know, I don't have, I don't have rapper Zuby. Yeah. And then, you know, podcast Zuby yeah. and in real life Zuby. Like yeah. I'm it's I'm you. the same person. You yeah. know, my, my sense of humor, the way that I speak, mm. the things that I talk about, like I'm I'm just me. And one thing that's so interesting about this world and where we are right now, and I think this is beautiful, mm. is you can really build an audience and inspire people and motivate and help people and be very successful genuinely by being yourself yeah agree really totally agree being yourself right and i think that's something that's beautiful about what we're doing right here with mm. podcasting because the truth is as well i think with podcasts i think one reason this medium is so powerful mm. is because you can't really be fake you can't be fake for how long can you be fake for right if you had someone and you sat down with them for two hours or three hours joe rogan style yeah and you're say say you're some politician yeah. who's just yeah. you know got yeah, got yeah, the gab yeah, but yeah. like you, you don't you're yeah. not genuine yeah You'll get exposed. Oh, mate. You, I, I, <laughs> I'll know in 30 seconds who's a blagger yeah. and who's not. You know. You yeah, know. Yeah. You know, We've I'm, been around too many people to clock who's exactly. telling the, pull keys exactly. and telling the truth. Yeah. You know, because I do TV stuff as yeah. well. And oftentimes on TV, if they ask me to go on Fox News, I speak for a grand total altogether. I might speak for one minute. Yeah. In a podcast, I might speak for two hours. Yeah. Right? So you can just go off a script for two minutes. If it's like, okay, you know, quick TV interview, you just stick to the, you know, stick to the stock answers and you don't really get pushed on things or whatever. But then in a podcast, it's like, okay, you get to really see who people are, how they think, what they're about. You can really flesh out mm. the ideas and get to get a feeling for the person. And I think, think that's, I think that's wonderful. I think the fact that authenticity is winning um, is beautiful. Absolutely. I think it's beautiful. And it's, it's never been like that before. Who's your next big guest? You had Joe Rogan. Who's your next big guest? Was it Elon Musk or Elon was just lately, wasn't it? Yeah, Elon was uh, just like Andrew month. Tate. Yeah. So I've actually, you know, what's funny with uh with Tate is, you know, he was the fourth ever guest on my podcast. Was he? I had him on in January 2019. What did you just email him? Did you and say you, so coming on? We'd been following each other since 2018 on Twitter. On Twitter, yeah, yeah, we'd followed each other in 2018 before either of us. You know, at the time, each of us, I had maybe 15,000 followers yeah. when he started following me. He had maybe 30,000 or something like that. So we did a podcast back in January 2018, which you know there was I, I got no pushback on. There was no contra, yeah. you know, no no one <laughs> no one tried to come for my head then or anything, right? Because it was too low profile yeah. for people to really care about. People hadn't heard of me. People hadn't heard mm -hmm. of him. And then we did another one in November, 2022. 22, okay. Yeah, um, a, week, a month before, you know, he and his brother got arrested and mm -hmm. all the all the other madness happened. So I was in Dubai and we did an in-person interview November, 2022. And that one was, uh, you know, that one was bigger. That one got a lot more, a lot more attention, obviously a lot more support, a lot more pushback, all of the things that, that come, you know, with interviewing someone who's considered so controversial. And um yeah, that's how it happened. I've had his brother on my podcast mm -hmm. as well. I think that was 2020 or 2021. How would you say Andrew, what would you say Andrew Tate is most famous for? It depends on who you ask, doesn't it? Mm. I think it totally depends on who you ask, actually. Um, I mean, what? overall, I think the majority of people who, I, I think there's, I think you'd get a very different answer from people who have genuinely listened to his content, yeah. long form and unedited, yeah. versus people who have, heard about him and Quick seen snapshots. seen bits yeah. and pieces yeah. yeah i think from the former category you're mainly going to get that he is you know inspiring and motivational and has a generally positive view about masculinity speaks a lot of necessary truths can go too far sometimes yeah. you know and you know be a, be a little bit wild and controversial and most people will say you know i, I don't agree with him on everything yeah. but i like a lot I, of what yeah. he says kind of thing right yeah. that'll be the typical answer but then i think if you get people who are running more off second or third hand information 
the view will typically be more will be a lot more negative and it'll be much closer to the way that the media has tried to frame him um and talking about the current ongoing yeah. criminal charges and things like that mm -hmm. and it'll be snapshots and highlights of literally the worst things he's ever said over the past seven or eight years which i think is going to paint uh naturally going to paint a biased mm. picture you know i i think he's a i think he's a complicated person intelligent um, you know, highly, highly highly intelligent, intelligent you know yeah. and, and when i say and this hard as, well, as nails oh abs yeah abs <laughs> absolutely was he four times world champ yeah, kickboxing, kickboxing world, champion. world champion yeah absolutely How big is he he's about six i think he's about six two six Weighing in roughly, I don't know, two hundred something pounds. Two hundred pounds, okay. two hundred, two hundred plus. Yeah, uh, he's a he's a big guy. Yeah. his brother's even bigger as well. Um, but you know, he's I, and and the thing is, I've I've met him at this point four times, four no five times. Um, I've been to his house twice. Whereabouts? You know, in Romania. Romania, okay. Yeah, you know, so I've I've hung out with him off. I've interviewed him twice, yeah. but I've also hung out with him off off air. Um, so I, you know, I get a lot of. <laughs> I'm I'm constantly dealing. It's it's actually interesting because in the past, as I said, like we followed each other since 2018, mm. and from 2018 to early 2022, that was never that was never a problem, yeah. right? Like it was it was fine, whatever. And then when the massive cancellation of him happened, and then of course, you know, months down the line, about six months later, the uh, arrest and the jail time and so on. I think anyone who knows him or is associated with him in any way people want to you know people want to get your take and they want yeah. to find out again you know what's he like in real life what yeah. about this what about that what are your thoughts on this and that and you know it can be um yeah it can it can sometimes get get frustrating mm. um when you have a nuanced view of someone or when you know if someone if someone has been has been led to believe that someone is like purely bad or evil or terrible or whatever and then you're like that's not hasn't been my mm. experience and there's this and there's this and there's this and you try to explain it sometimes people don't really like that yeah people don't really like that i think you know people want to be able to kind of see the world and see people in a much more simple view even if they don't really have that much that much information when all this come out were you in shock well on my podcast he said it was going to happen oh, he did say it was going to happen yeah yeah, if you listen to the podcast I did with him, November 2022, mm. um, I did a podcast with him, the episode number. Just for the listeners, tell them your podcast. It's called Real Talk with Zuby. Mm. So if you just search Real Talk with Zuby, Andrew Tate, you can listen to the whole two-hour interview. Yeah. We talked about a lot of topics, but this was after he'd had the massive cancellation and yeah. you know had his bank accounts closed and been kicked off of Facebook and Instagram yeah. and YouTube and all that. All of that had happened. And he was saying in that that he thinks you know they're going to try to arrest him. Yeah. Right. And then he's he's talked about the concept of having three lives. Right. First, they cancel you. Then they try to put you in jail um, and then they kill you. Yeah. So that's why any interview you listen to, he'll constantly repeat. I, I would never kill myself. Mm. So, you know, I think I, I think he's a I think he's a complicated figure. Mm. Um, and he's, when you say complicated, explain yes. what you mean that he's a complicated man. What I mean is that I think ninety nine point nine percent of people who the thing is, it's weird when you have someone who. And I guess this could go for any famous person or celebrity. Yeah. When people can only act on the information and form conclusions about what they know and hear and see, if they don't personally know you, mm. right? If someone has never personally met me, someone's never personally met mm. me, they can listen to my podcasts, they can see my tweets, they can see my social media posts, they can watch my videos, they can even listen to my music. And they can form a picture yeah. of, do I like or dislike this person? Do I agree or do I disagree with them? And some people have an accurate picture. And the more, the more of me that you listen to, and the more you hear me explain my ideas and talk and so on at length, you'll get a more accurate picture yeah. of what that is, right? And the less bias of a framing you have. If you just take a snapshot, I'm, I'm sure of the hundreds of hours of podcasts and things I've done. I'm sure someone can like, you know, find the, yeah, take some, to, some could, yeah. could snip some yeah, stuff yeah. out and, or, you know, find some of my most controversial tweets mm. that I've ever put out over the past 14 mm. years. And someone can, you know, paint a picture of, oh, you know, this guy is some type of bigot or he mm. hates this people or he's this or he's that. And, you know, and, and I'll, there's thousands of people out there. There are thousands of people. I'm fully aware. There are thousands of people out there, possibly millions, who have a very, very distorted view of who I am. 
Why right? do you think? Why do you think that? Because they might see, oh, he, you know, the, what I did with the deadlift thing, yeah. and then some of my explanations, and they'll, oh, he's transphobic. Oh, he hates trans people. You know, that's what they'll say. Oh, he hates he hates trans people, and then they'll mm. extend that further. Oh, he hates LG. He hates LGBT. He hates the whole yeah. thing, right? Or oh, he. You know, they'll listen to a pod a podcast I did where someone asked me about, I don't know, something about differences between men and women or what oh he's oh he's a misogynist as well now. Yeah. They'll hear me say that I think white privilege is a nonsense concept, or they'll hear me say that uh, you know, I was on G B News the other day and I was being asked about racism in the UK and I said that I, you know, in a much longer answer, I said that I believe the UK is one of the least racist countries in the entire world. Is right? that right? Yeah. That's your and belief. Okay. Absolutely. Mm. What are we comparing to? Mm. I mean, yes. And so someone will take oh, he denied that racism exists. Right. Okay. So right. Oh, he's a, away. yeah, yeah. So, so they'll they'll take all of these things, and now you have someone who's a, you know, who's a a, a self a self hating black man who supports white supremacy, and he's transphobic, <laughs> and he's homophobic, and he's like he hates women, and he's this, and he's this, and and you know, and then you oh you add that to the top that you know I'm more conservative leaning in some of my views. Oh, and he's a right wing like far right, mm. whatever. Oh, and he he had Andrew Tate on his podcast, so he's okay, yeah. so he supports all of the worst things he's yeah. ever done or said. Okay. Oh, and he he look, there's a photo of him with that person who I also don't like, and you know that that's how some people operate it's not an honest mode of operation mm. but there are people who do that so i would like to think that anyone who has actually met me yeah and knows me would probably give me a very positive absolutely ca character reference have you but, um, ever had any racism towards you in the uk by anyone or by the police or anything gone on <clears throat> um racism yeah honestly people want me to say yes and this is the crazy world we live in no Brilliant. I haven't. I, you know, I've had people on the internet say, you know, stuff, nasty yeah. stuff or DM me yeah. something not pleasant. Oftentimes it's even from black people. Yeah. Primarily, actually. <laughs> I'd say most racial slurs I've received are from fellow yeah. black people, um, which is even wilder. But, you know, honestly not. Honestly not. I mean, something I was saying, I've said it many times, but I think, you know, the demand for racism outstrips the supply and mm -hmm. it has done for quite a long time this is not to say that racism does not exist mm -hmm. like of course yes yes it exists in every in, in every nation to some to some degree and some extent but if you look from any historical perspective or from a global perspective mm -hmm. i don't know how someone would be arguing that you know the uk in 2023 or even the usa in 2023 is some horribly yeah. you know racist place where I mean, I just, I'm like, dude, go outside. Yeah. Go outside, walk, walk around a city. Like, are, are you seeing people mm. at each other's throats and discriminating and segregating? No, everyone's just getting on and being normal. Tell me about that day when you got held up with machine guns. Oh, boy. Um, boy that was 2009, Bournemouth train station. Okay, yeah, I can explain that. So um, this is in the time period when I was doing my music full time. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it was actually between, this is between um, Oxford and my corporate job. Yeah. So I graduated, two thousand. it would have been 2008. Mm. Graduated 2007, 2008, I was doing my music full time. I'd been selling my CDs in Southampton on, um, what's it called? Above Bar Street. Mm. So I'd been out there all day. It was a Saturday, I believe. And I'd been just selling my CDs, normal day, you know, pretty successful day. Most My backpack was mostly empty. And... Um, I was on my train on the train back to Bournemouth from Southampton, well, half hour journey, simple, done it a billion times. And uh, I came out, the, the train stopped in Bournemouth station. I came out, um, I saw one of my friends actually, and uh, I, I was I was in the process of saying hello to him. And actually as, as the train was pulling up, I noticed that there were a lot of armed police on the platform. Um, for non-UK listeners, you have to keep in mind that the British police typically don't carry guns. Mm. So it was like a firearm unit, which they normally have if there's like a criminal threat or a terrorist threat, that kind of thing. So I, I hadn't noticed that. And I was just like, oh, okay, like there's something, yeah. there's something going on. Um, but anyway, I, I come out, I come out the station about within two seconds, two, three seconds of me coming off. I just hear, um, you know, stop, you know, put your hands, put your hands up. Like what? And so I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking around like, whoa, what's, something's going on like like everyone else I'm trying to see what's happening and then a police officer pushes me pushes me back to, back towards the train and I look up dodge and I see one two three four five guns trained on me put your hands up get your hands up, get your hands up in the air get your hands up, get down on the ground 
I don't even know what's going on. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I comply. I comply. Hands up in the air. Next thing, I, you know, I'm, I'm lying down, face down on the ground with my hands up. They're putting handcuffs on me. The, the arresting officer tells me I'm under arrest for a Section 1 firearms offense. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, I can't even explain what was going on in my brain in this moment. This is all happening within 10 seconds. I don't know. It feels like I'm in... It, it it almost didn't feel real. Yeah. It felt very surreal. I was like, "Is this a weird dream? Is this mm-hmm. like I, 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 I?" It was it was very odd, you know. In the hindsight, you know what happened, but at the time, in the moment in time, I'm just like, but all the, all that I was thinking is, you know, stay alive, stay alive, right? Listen, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. I don't don't know what's going on. Um, and then you know the guy says this, and then they take me off, um, into one of the like one of the side rooms on the on the platform, and. They're explaining. They're they're explaining to me again. You know, I'm under arrest for a Section One firearms incident. They say something about Basingstoke, and I'm 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 just confused. I'm standing there in handcuffs. Three, four police officers there. You know, they 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 search mm-hmm. you, make sure I don't have, you know, because they mm-hmm. obviously think I have some gun on me or something. And I'm really just confused. And then they they started asking me a couple questions. They they said something about um a firearm incident in Basingstoke. I haven't been to Basingstoke. I've been in Southampton. Mm. Obviously, I haven't. <laughs> obviously, I haven't been uh, you're running around with a mm. gun. And so, even though I was very confused, at this point, I was already quite relieved because I didn't have any idea what was going on. But I know I haven't done anything. Yeah, I know I've done. I've done absolutely nothing. So whatever, whoever they think I am, whatever they think they've done, they're wrong. So I don't know how long this ordeal is going to take, mm. but. I really have nothing to fear at this point. The guns are no longer on me. I have nothing to fear because I haven't done anything wrong, you know? So they're asking me all these questions. And it, it was interesting because as, as they continue to ask me things, they, I could tell as time went on, the arresting officers themselves, I could see that they were they were doubtful. As to what had happened, because I was like, you know, because I, I had the the ticket in my pocket, and I said I haven't been. To, I was like, you know, I've been. To, they were like, because I had my backpack on me, and they were like, what's in your backpack? I was like, some CDs and flyers and stuff, and they're like, you know, they were asking me about it. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm an independent rapper. Um, I was just in Southampton City Centers promoting my music today. Uh, you can look in the bag, like it's got my like, the CD. You know, they, they bring out the CD, and it's got me on it, right? And they're like, you know, I'm wearing my, I'm down with Zuby Zuby. t-shirt, you know, and I'm, and so they're asking me all these questions and I'm just like answering very honestly that, you know, do you have anything else on, you know, do you have any, do you have any drugs on you or anything? Mm. I was like, no, I was like, I don't even drink alcohol, mate. Yeah. Um, like, I'm, I was like, you know, like I, I, I'm like the most sober, so you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm like completely teetotal. I'm, I'm just like, no. Was there any anger in you at the time? Honestly, no. No, you were no, just at peace. No, okay. I'm, I'm an extraordinarily calm person, thank God. Mm. Because if I had a different temperament, I think the outcome of this could have been very different. Mm. Um, but I was very, very calm and, you know, and and respectful. And, and you know, I was, I even mentioned to them, I, I was there, to, I was, I basically started telling them my story, you know, because I just graduated from Oxford and I'm there telling them that I, you know, I graduated. From, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there telling them my story, right? And, and so, the, you know, they're, they're, they're a bit like, I did hear one of them sort of whisper to yeah, this doesn't seem like no. someone who would, uh, you know, do yeah. X, Y, Z, whatever. Yeah. But I guess they had, you know, they have to go through with the process. Mm. So I got taken over. And that was kind of weird because I, I kind of got like perp walked. You, you know, in Bournemouth Station, there's the yeah. bridge. So I had to go from like from over the bridge onto the other side. So, you know, the station's quite busy. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, 7 p.m. or so. Right. And I'm there in handcuffs surrounded by police officers and people are, you know, looking like, whoa, like, who is this guy kind of thing? Like, what's what's happened? So that bit was, you know, was a little bit embarrassing because mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, I don't want people to see me like this. Yeah. Like, I haven't done anything. And then I got put in the um, I got put in the police car. They drove me to Bournemouth Police Station. And, you know, I was standing there. They asked me my name and so on. And I'm standing there, you know, still in the handcuffs. And then... um. About, I want within ten minutes. Someone comes out and is just like, "I'm so sorry, we 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 got we got the wrong guy, we got the wrong person." Um, so you know they 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 apologize. They they offered to drive me back home. I actually said, "You know what? Take me back to the station because I had my van parked there." Mm. They're like, "Are you sure?" Like I was like, "Yeah, just take me back to the station. Like I'll drive back home." But then I got back home and um, I opened the door and my, you know my I just told them, my my mom, mom and dad were there. And I was like, you guys are not going to believe what just happened. And then, uh, you know, my, especially my mom is, you know, more, uh, yeah. 
she she you know these things these things upset her more than they upset yeah. me mm-hmm. you know the, me even talking about it on this podcast if she heard it this would upset her yeah. more than it upsets me and then you know the police came around the house to you know explain you know sit down with me and my parents and you know explain what happened and this and that and then it opened the next few months were kind of weird because you know it opened a big investigation into it there were two points of weirdness you know the the incident itself but then the um someone had taken a photo of it like when it had happened so the following day you know the i don't know if they still have it but the metro newspaper yeah with the free one in yeah, london yeah, yeah. which they yeah. gave it i was that that photo of me was on the front cover the following day you're joking man. no on the front cover the free newspaper they in london, say all so press is good press but not not that I yeah guess. <laughs> so there's literally a photo of me there and i'm and and but but i hadn't been identified at this point okay. by the time they published the paper so all my friends in london are like because you know like some of them have heard mm. about this and they're like dude like what's what's going on you know um and then the following day i was on the front cover of the metro again but it was right because this by this point they've put two and two together and worked out who i am and saying what saying j- misidentity just, it, it was, or were they saying or were they saying yes it, okay. it, it, it said something like you know oxford university graduates i don't remember the the <laughs> the or a star graduate Oxford. yeah so <laughs> the, honestly i'm so glad that i have like such a clean yeah. sheet in history yeah, right because yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know at, at that time if there had been some you know dirt mm. on me or something it would have come out then um so it it was weird because then there was this media thing you know outside the house there were uh, media vans bbc itv like like they all wanted to interview me talk to me and it was also really weird because <laughs> you know I wanted to again. I'd been spending all these years trying to court attention, mm. right? I'd, re- I'd I'd tried to get the BBC to cover my music. Mm. I tried to get these people to like, hey, like, you know, I'm this. I'm doing some cool yeah. stuff. Like, you should check this out. And then the only thing they now want to talk about is, oh, like, tell us the story about this. Yeah. Tell us the story about that. And you know, and I think I I did one interview. I did the one show. Mm. Um, and I, I declined most of the rest of them. You know, there were people also pushing me, like, yeah, you know, you should do this. You should do this. And I'll be totally honest with you, man. And this is something I've always I've always maintained, and I guess it's a key part of my philosophy, is I didn't want to be like made out to be a victim. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because there and also at this point, the investigation hadn't been done. So it wasn't known why this had happened, like what had gone wrong in their communications, whatever. It hadn't been known. So people were speculating. There's all these stories mm. flying around. There's people, oh, they thought he was a terrorist. Other people are saying, oh, it was just racist cops mm. and they, you know, wanted to terrorize a black man. There's this, there's so and and people almost wanted me to run with their narrative, yeah, okay. right? They wanted me to be like, oh yeah, you know, those police officers are racist, mm-hmm. and you know, it's so hard to be a black man. You know, they they kind of want. I could see that people wanted me to kind of take that, but I was like, dude, that's not how I feel. Yeah, I don't even know if that's the reality. I don't know if this had anything to do with my skin color. Mm-hmm. I don't know who they thought I was. I don't know. All I know is they thought I was some guy in Basingstoke yeah. who'd done something with a gun. That's all I know. Um, so yeah, I you know I. I wrote a song about it called Divided We Stand, but apart from that, it's one of those things that um, you know, I I didn't I didn't really like talk about all that much mm. once the thing had calmed down, you know? Like I said, there were the, I think that's a good move. Yeah. I think it's a very good move. Yeah, I didn't want that yeah. to be like that's that's not my story. That's what you're identifying. You know what I mean? Yo, yeah, no, no, really. it's like look, this is a, a messed up situation that happened yeah. to me, and the most important lesson I can give to people is if you are whoever you are, if you ever for whatever reason, find yourself in that type of situation, just comply. Yeah. Comply. You'll be confused. You'll be scared. You'll fe- just just comply mm-hmm. and stay alive and deal with whatever it is later. There have been so many of these incidents, especially in the USA, but it's happened in the UK as well, where that type of situation happens and someone tries to fight the police or they try to, you know, run away or this. And that's when people get killed. Yeah. Right. So the, the, to me, like that's the most important lesson someone can take away from that mm. situation is just in the heat of the moment. Hopefully 99.9 percent of people are never going to need this advice. Mm. But if you ever happen to be, you know, in a mistaken identity situation and the police roll in or, you know, the SWAT team is called on you or just something, cool. just 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 be cool, be compliant, mm. listen to what they say, stay alive first thing and then deal with it later. When was it when you first started to speak to Elon Musk? Uh, last year. Last year. And last did you year. reach out to him on Twitter? Yeah, I just... Um, uh, so what actually happened was uh, I started noticing him, him replying to some of my tweets. So, okay. You know, I, I, I get I have our many viral tweets yeah. every week. Just get, so the and, listeners know, how many followers have you got on Twitter? Right now, 1.15 million. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. 
Amazing. Yeah. Um, so he just started responding to some of my tweets and I would, you know, respond to some of his. Yeah. Like he's, he's a funny guy, right? Yeah. He posts memes and so yeah, on. Yeah. So we just in on public Twitter would occasionally reply yeah. to each other's stuff. And then um, in February, actually, I, he started interacting quite a bit more. And one of my friends WhatsApped me and was like, dude, how long has Elon been following you? Yeah. And I was like, wait, he's following? <laughs> so, so I just went on his thing because he was only following, he only follows about 300 people. Yeah, yeah. And he just had the, you know, the follows, you, the follows you thing. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. And then uh, actually, funnily enough, I looked at that and then I, I had a DM and he DM'd me. Um, Cause I'd actually written a thing giving, so I've been on Twitter since 2009 mm. and I wrote a thread about things that they could do to improve it. Mm. And so he'd read that and responded to it. And he'd also written something about, um, rev oh, this is a big one actually. Yeah. The, well, I saw you the, the other day, sharing. you said something, said, why don't we turn this into a revenue sharing yeah, yeah. platform? And he replied straight away. So let's do it. Yeah. And it's been done now. So you're the instigator yeah, of I got, many I got, people I got, out there I got, I, got money. A, I got 12 grand Did you? last week from Twitter. Did you? Yeah. Revenue For sharing. how long? Um, February to June. Brilliant. Yeah. So I, he'd posted something about Twitter advertising in October and I said, Hey, every other social media platform, uh, not in these exact words, but every other social media platform does revenue sharing with creators, so YouTube, uh, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, right? Like they're advertising driven platforms. So it's fair to give the people who create the content that brings people to the platform yeah. a share of it. I said, you know, Twitter should do the same thing. And he said, yeah, absolutely. I agree. And then, um, yeah, out of the blue, I got a message like this is like five days ago. Yeah, I got a message from Twitter saying, you know, it was like twelve thousand four hundred dollars or something uh, to be deposited into my account from revenue. Thank you very much. I, I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we just started DMing back and forth. Um, we've got quite a quite a long thread on there. And I, I just literally told him, I said, um, hey, I've got a podcast called Real Talk with Zuby uh, when I'm next in the U.S., I know, I know you're a busy guy, but mm. you know, happy to come to you, whatever, be flexible. You know, I'd love to have you on it. And he just said, sure. I was like, dude, cool. The quality. Yeah, great. Yeah. So when I was last in the States, I went to the US in May. Um, I had some events in Miami. I spoke at the Bitcoin conference. And when I was there, I was continuing to communicate with him. And I was like, hey, you know, are you in San Francisco? Are you in Austin? Whatever. Like, I'd love to get a date mm. put down. And, you know, he's he's so busy. So it was, is this it was still all over Twitter or just via email or this is all, Have this you got his mobile number? This is all Twitter DMs. Do you got his mobile number? Um, no, no. But I can reach him. Mm. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're just DMing back and forth. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then eventually we, we managed to pick a date. So I'd actually, I actually went out to San, to California. I had a, I did a podcast there and then I was going to go to San Francisco, but um, I found out he, you know, he, he said he wouldn't, he, he was overseas and was going to come back later than planned. So, you know, yeah. they asked if they could uh, push it out a week. So I went back to Miami and then I went back out to San Francisco the following week, went to Twitter headquarters and sat down. We knocked out that interview. Uh, it's episode episode two sixty three. How long was the interview? It's uh, and did you freestyle it? Yeah, good conversation. Just yeah, like great conversation. It was yeah. late as well. It was uh, the, most people won't know this, but the interview was uh, we didn't start until nine p.m. Mm. So we was but, it set for nine p.m. or was it like no. I'm busy, I'm busy. Or can we do it later? Yeah, okay. it got it got pushed back. Okay, it got pushed back. So I think we were supposed to start at seven. Yeah, but um, it got pushed back. So, but dude, it was, it was a massive honor. Yeah, it was sure. a massive honor. And again, to have one of these moments where I'm like, man, five years ago, I was selling my CDs yeah. in, you know, <laughs> now I'm sitting down here with Elon and, and he was, he was just as happy to meet me yeah. as I was to meet him. Brilliant. So was, was he like, wasn't like, oh, this is a chore. No, Come on, not, this was like no, a nice not convo. Not at all, not at all. Because yeah. he, he'd been following me. Yeah, we, yeah, we'd yeah. been chatting, yeah. right? And he was yeah. just like, man, it's great. It's good. It's good to meet you yeah. in person. You know, we've been, we've been chatting online. Well, so how would you, how were you? How would you describe Elon Musk to someone? Just who who had never heard of him before? Yeah. Oh wow, um, he is a serial entrepreneur mm. and mogul. He's the CEO of many large companies: Tesla, SpaceX, Twitter, um, and a couple smaller ones. You know, Neuralink, the boring company. Uh, formerly involved in PayPal, he is uh, you know, putting rockets into into space he, he's like the real world iron man yeah type of guy yeah um he's a you know father to many many children mm. he's you know one of the smartest people in the world mm. and one of the most inventive and creative and out of the box thinking 
One, one thing I loved about actually speaking with him and spending a couple hours with him was, you know, there's some people who, uh, you know, when you, when you talk to them, you realize, how it's the best way to put it? There are some people I, I speak to and because I, I myself, I'm, I'm like hyper ambitious and I think, I actually, I myself think way bigger than yeah, most people. Yeah. But when I meet someone who thinks like way bigger than me, mm. that doesn't happen very mm. often. And I'm like, he's there talking about, you know, human hu humanity being a, a multi-planetary species. Like I'm, I'm cool with Earth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm <laughs> crazy. Right? Like, like I'm okay with Earth. You know what I mean? I'm not personally all that interested in going to Mars or whatever. Yeah. But you when you're talking to someone who's, you know, literally spending, sending rockets out there yeah. with the goal of colonizing Mars and all this, you, you realize, man, there's levels to there's this. Levels, there, yeah. There. <laughs> it, what, what blew you away in that conversation with him? Did he mention anything in that conversation? A topic you're like, my God, that has just sent me to another level. Hmm. Let's see. What was the most? What was like? Was the it taking? Was it taking humans to other planets? Was it SpaceX? Was it putting chips in someone's brain? <laughs> well, like, that, what, what, that's uh, definitely the thing. That, that's one thing that I absolutely wanted to ask him about mm. because I love, I love a lot of what Elon has done and is doing. I am genuinely concerned about Neuralink. Yeah, I do think that that is a. I think the first couple iterations of it will be mostly positive, right? If the goal is to help blind people to see, yeah. help, uh, you know, paralyzed people to yeah. walk and so on, it, it's kind of hard to be against that. Um, who, my... are they, who are they going to test it on? That's the bit for me. Who are they going <laughs> to test it on? Who's going to be the first one? <laughs> I'll do it. Put your hand uh, up. Go on, off you go. Whack it know. in. Whack the chip in and see what happens. Maybe, like... you, maybe, maybe that's how Elon gets so much done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I'll test it on myself. Yeah, there we go. I don't know. It would explain a lot of things. <laughs> it would do, wouldn't it? It would explain a lot of things. Yeah. M my concern is, you know, the, the sort of transhuman element of it. Mm. Um, you know, so even if we look at smartphones, because actually he brought up the example of like us being semi-cyborgs already because of how yeah. attached we are to our smartphones. And I think that's a concern even with smartphones themselves, right? Mm. I, think, I think it's a concern living in a world where you cannot function without one. Right, where it, it goes from being something that's purely optional to being almost mandatory. Yeah. Right. There's situations and times where it's like, oh wait, I can't wait, I can't park my car unless I have a smartphone yeah. or I can't do this or that. So, you know, you're kind of forcing people to have it. And so my concern with something like Neuralink is that it goes to a stage where, okay, this is no longer just for people who to get people who have disability up to normal yeah. ability. This is now people who are already, you know, you're already fully able-bodied, yep. but you want to go to a whole, to a whole yeah. nother level. Yeah. And then for people to even be able to compete, right? And to almost like function and integrate into society. Everyone now needs the chip in the way that, you know, it went from, okay, a few people had smartphones That's and right. you didn't I, need yeah. one. And kind of now you need yeah. one, you know, it could be that, okay, this thing all starts out fine. And then a couple decades down the line, if you don't have this chip in your brain, you're just falling behind. Yeah. And that is my, I, I have a lot of concerns about that on a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. I also, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I think, I, I'm, I love technology for the most part, but I think it's very important that we, that technology serves us mm. rather than human beings exist to serve the technology. Do you think technology is taking over humans at the moment? I do think so. Mm. I think I think it's concerning, right? I think that most people's smartphones control them more mm. than they control their smartphones. I think if we're being totally honest, you know, to be brutally honest, almost every single adult is somewhat addicted to their smartphone. Agree. Are you addicted? To some degree, yeah. Yeah, same. Yeah, to some degree. And I'm but not, I, I'm I'm conscious of it. I'm conscious of it. Yeah. Same. But I'm not an addictive personality. But I believe now I'm I'm realizing that I'm constantly looking. You know, you look at at the end of the day, you've gone, you've picked your phone up 140 times. What, what are you looking at? Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm not a, I'm a creator. I'm not sort of a person who's just flicking yep. through, you know, but there's so many different apps and yep. things going on that you and, need to and, keep and on top of for your business and life and yeah. And you, scary. And, and you could have just checked everything. Yeah. And then 30 seconds later, what do you have the urge to do? Check it again. Check it again. It's like you, I just, and all my notifications already, are off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's off. I, yeah, that, so, that thing yeah. can stay there. And yeah. do you know what? what's lovely as well? If you turn that off at night before you go to bed and you don't turn it on till after... 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. That feels like a win. It does. How easy is it to wake up, boom, flick on your phone, messages, WhatsApps, yeah. mates, business, yeah. social media. It's 24 seven. It, it never sleeps. Yeah, it and you, and you yeah. also have literal, you know, if you look, think about design as well. Mm. 
all the most addictive apps, they have what's called infinite scroll, mm. which means you can, you know, with traditional web pages, you scroll up and down and there's a limit, right? If you're on Twitter, if you're on Instagram, if you're on Facebook, it's infinite scroll, right? Yeah, you can just course. keep TikTok infinite scroll. You mm. just keep on going. There's no end, mm. right? There's always more content. There's always that next person's take, that next video, that next photo, whatever it is. So it's designed to be it's designed to be addictive. And most people actually have the notifications on and this and this. So, you know, even for someone like people like ourselves who are more disciplined than average and perhaps even more cognizant mm -hmm. of these type of issues than average, it's still difficult. Yeah. It's still difficult, um, let alone, you know, with children. Mm. Um, and but teenagers. is your subconscious, my subconscious mind is, you're picking up your phone again, mm -hmm. you're looking at your phone, I'm put your same. phone down, yeah. put your phone down. Why do you need your phone? Get it away, you yes. don't need it right now. Yeah. You know, but what I find is what I enjoy you know, they say there's a lot of negatives with phones, but if I'm not with my phone for four hours, I'm playing sport or playing golf or I'm doing yeah. podcasting, I enjoy going back to my phone and seeing all the messages and, and catching up with stuff. Yeah. But I don't like the constant looking the whole time. Yeah, exactly. It comes mm. back to the point I was making of, you know, do you control the technology mm. or does the technology control you? I think that's actually kind of the big question. It's the same thing with, uh, you know, we, we did talk about AI because mm. he's concerned about AI. Um, and that's the concern with it, right? W will we move into a world where the AI is at the forefront, mm. artificial intelligence is at the forefront, and human intelligence is behind it? Way behind. Right? That's, that's a concern for me, right? If AI is a tool that we use, that's cool, right? If the tool is now using us, yeah. uh, I mean, I guess his biggest concern is, you know, if it got to that level, then what if the AI were programmed to you know, just no, how do you, pro how do you program ethics and AI and morality mm. into an AI, right? What if the AI, what if we, what if we had an ultimate AI and it decided we don't need people, yeah. right? But or you don't like think it's going that way. I've got a prime example. I've got a girl in the office there. Has she just worked on AI and she mm. said, my job's redundant. It's concerning. She's done that. She'd come in and said, my job is redundant. Yeah. I can't say, well, see you later. I've actually moved it to another, another yeah. one of our businesses moved yeah. across, but she was honest to say, it's all there. Yeah. You don't need. You, you don't. You don't need me. You don't need me. Spending thirty old grand on me. Yeah, that is scary. It, it it is scary because you know people compare it to other technologies, and I don't think they're really thinking it through. Because people are like, oh well, people said that about cars. People said that about this. I'm like, a car and AI, like the jump. Yeah, is so much more significant, right? A car, yes, it helps you get to A to B faster and easier, but a car doesn't replace. Yeah you and replace so many potential jobs and things that human beings have done for because you have to remember we don't just work for money mm. right work also provides a sense of purpose yeah. Yeah. a sense of earning community community yeah. also also earning i think there's very something very important about working for money versus just being given money right there's a difference between someone who wins 10 million pounds in a lottery and someone who built a business Agree. And or invested and did stuff to and earn taken, 10 million. And taking the risk. Taking the risk, taking yes. Taking the risk and enjoying the process and going through the ups and downs and the fear yeah. and the pressures. Yeah. If I was given a million quid, that wouldn't make me happy. No, and you also wouldn't value it in the same way. You'll value That's, the million quid you worked for yes. more than the million quid you were given. It, it, it's the same million quid, but it's not. And there'd be hundreds and thousands of people listening to this going, God, if I was given a million quid, I'd be happy. But most but lottery winners go broke. They, they go broke. <laughs> Who's the lottery winner who bought all the cars and, and motorbikes and... Do you remember Do you remember that lottery winner? I think he there's lost, a lot of them. Yeah, there's a, yeah, you are right, there's a lot. Can't remember his name. Can't remember his name. He basically bought motorbikes, cars, houses, he put, did the whole yeah. lot of all his mates, party dad, yeah. and just lost it within a year. Yeah, it's, it's very common. And yeah. that's because you don't value... If you don't work for something at all, mm. it's quite hard to value it. Not, not, not in all situations, mm. right? There are things, you, you know, we, you know, things that are less less material in that sense but I, I don't know that that's my that's my wider concern you know that that is uh I just think that right now and look I I understand you can't really like slow down or stop yeah. technology or whatever in, in many ways too quickly, so yeah but there, there's a yeah. where I, I just don't think that most people have paused okay so say say what happened with that employee yeah. of yours yeah what about when another 5 billion people have that realization, mm. that, that moment of like, wait, this- Could replace this. me. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's gonna happen. That's where we're going. 
And I, I just happen. I just don't think it's being talked like all these other things are being talked yeah. about and discussed. And, you know, people, are, you know, the climate, the economy, the uh, politics, you know, this, 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 like people are about all that. I'm mm. like, yo, what about this thing mm. like this in the next two, three years? Do you know, do you know when it really freaked me out? Cool. Have you heard the um, have you heard it doing like the, the AI music that sounds exactly like Jay-Z or Kanye West wow. or mm. Like as I'm a Jay Z fan, yeah. I'm a Kanye fan. I was like, this sounds exactly Maybe. like him. Because five years ago, I did not think that was going to happen. Mm. I because I I'd heard about AI music, mm. but it was all like electronic mm. music, right? No lyrics, no voices. It was like, okay, you know, a computer can yeah. kind of produce these beats. But I'm like, I'm like hip hop. Like they they they've, they've got like the rap. I'm just like, okay, this is. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, this is crazy. When you're seeing some of the images now, even in the past year, it's mm -hmm. changed so much, right? It's gone from, okay, you can see that's an AI generated image. Now you're getting like photo quality, photo quality stuff where you can't know really, the difference. You just wouldn't know mm -hmm. the difference. And I'm just like, okay, that's, it's cool in a way, mm -hmm. but I'm also like, that's also concerning. Like, if you think about the potential implications mm -hmm. of that, what does this mean for copyright law? What does this mean for people's privacy? Can someone just like take you and take your voice yeah. and start like putting you in yeah. things that you're not in and making you say things you never mm. said? Like all of that stuff. I'm like, wait, is it, are people thinking about this? Mm. Like that's the part that I find. It's happening. Uh, it, Do you know it, what yeah. I'm really scared about is taking cash out of society. Yes. How do you know the value of money. Mm. How do you know the value of money? I grew up with. My dad would walk around with a grand in his pocket. Yeah. He always did yeah. in the eighties. No, that's what he did. He was, he was a bodybuilder. He was a big yeah. lump. We lived above pubs, and that was his world. And a grand. so we'd always count money as quick as possible, and that would okay. be our thing growing up. See how quickly you can count grand <laughs> versus him. You've taken that out of the equation now. Everyone's now just doing this. They're going into shops. Mm -hmm. Beep beep. Yeah. You don't know whether you you're, you're, how much you're spending. Beep beep mm -hmm. beep beep. It's been cash. Well, my whole nightclub world has been cash for the last. And festival world for the last 25 years. That's mm. all I've done is throw parties and festivals and, and nightclubs. You know, it's always been cash. Mm. Last year, it was 95% card, 5% cash. Wow. It's completely flipped. No one's got cash on them anymore. Wow. 95.5, that's interesting. 95.5. Yeah. And it's been 100 for all these, 100% cash for all these years. It's gone 95.5 where people are actually going to the bar now yeah. and spending 200 pounds. And that was accelerated in the 2020 to 2022 the, yeah. period. But also the scary thing is people are spending more mm. without realizing how much they're spending. Because if you take 100 pound out to go to a festival for the bar and you've got, and it's, it's, it's an hour to go, you're going, well, I've got 20 quid left. I want to get a cab home, have a pizza and get my off skis. Here now, you're at the bar just going, who wants a beer? Yeah. Get all your mates around, bam. Bam. Beep. Do another 100 quid on that. Beep. Yeah. Do, do you know something that- Which is going to put I'm... even people in more debt. Yeah. Which just has that knock-on effect of the anxiety and the, everything else that goes with it. And Yeah, it's it's difficult, man. You know, this is, the, this is where people can become slaves to convenience, mm. right? Because the argument is typically, oh, you know, cash is, it's inconvenient. You mm. have to count the change. You have to walk around with stuff. Cash is king in your pockets and it always and so will on. be. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, <laughs> going. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. You know, I think, um, and, and I, I'll be honest, I, as a musician, I felt this much earlier, mm. right? With the, I like CDs. I like physical media. Yeah. I right? think, I think, I'll end up coming back around, hopefully. Hopefully. LPs, hopefully. CDs, who knows? Um, you know, vinyl had a little bit of a resurgence, yeah. but n nothing compared to what, you know, CDs were like. Mm. And, you know, there's something nice about a physical a physical book, yeah. physical products. There is, you know, I, I, look, my, my greatest concern might be with, in terms of all this area is human beings losing their humanity. Mm. That's really, I, if I could sum it up in a sentence, that's kind of what concerns me. I, I like technology. I think it's amazing. We can have this conversation and we can, you know, thousands of people out mm. there can can listen to it and we can do all these things. But I think it's so important that this... This is not lost. I, I don't want to live in a future or my children or grandchildren yeah. live in a future where, you know, they're, they're strapped in something with some headset yeah. strapped to their, they're, they're, they're in some vat, right? Yeah. And there's like, they're living in some VR world. And it's just like, that, I'm just like, I don't want that to be the future mm. of humanity. Like, let's have technology and let's use technology to make our life better in various ways. But it's so important to not lose mm. this people, right here. Conversations, this. good yeah. people, good chats. Yeah. I think it's going that way, though. It just explains the listener what what AI is. Artificial intelligence, um, man. As a computer science, I should have like a perfect description of this. Talk to but, uh, talk to as if you're talking to me as a ten year old. Okay. Artificial intelligence is a 
computer program or set of computer programs that can mimic various forms of human intelligence. Problem solving, um, pattern resolution, and more advanced levels, creativity. You know, I'd say, uh, you know, something like a search engine can use AI to help determine what people might be searching for and how it should be ordered. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say on a basic level, it's a, a program or set of programs or algorithms mm. that mimic various forms of intelligence, primarily human intelligence. That would probably be like the yeah. the summary. Yeah, I think it's scary. I have yeah. to say, yeah, I, I do. Um, and and part of the reason it concerns me is because even with the rise of smartphones and social media, which have been massive for my own personal yeah. career and everything I do, mm. but for every one person like us who genuinely uses it to create mm. and broadcast messages and out, mm. you know, there's another hundred people or 50 who are just consuming, just 100%, consuming. 100% yeah. just, just consumption, right? And they're not, you know, and, and you know, even what you're consuming is very important. Yeah. But even just the, the sheer, just the sitting there scrolling, 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 spending five, six, seven, eight, eight hours a day doing that. If you do not balance it, with okay here here's here's maybe the best best way to put it i think these things are all fine additions mm. but they are poor sub right there's nothing wrong with having an active social life mm. and family life and you're out there and you're talking to people and you're having real world conversations hugging people and shaking hands mm. and meeting people and then you amplify that yeah. and reach even more people the, the social media is an addition mm. i think that's great if it's a substitution I think that's actually when it becomes a problem. Mm. When it's like, oh, okay, I'm no longer going out and meeting people and learning to, you know, to talk to men, talk to women. I, I'm, I'm not even doing. I'm just all I'm doing is sitting there on my laptop or on my phone, and I've and and now I've even I don't I know don't even have the skills now to sit down and talk to another person, you know, look them in the eye and smile at them and talk to them, and you know. I, I'm concerned about people losing that. And you see, I mean, there has been massive rise, especially amongst teenagers in what loneliness and depression, suicidal ideation, um, body dysmorphia issues, all these kinds of things. It's all coincided with the introduction of smartphones and social media. So that trajectory is already happening. Mm. So adding more things yeah. that are going to take away from that natural human experience, to me, that's, that's a concern because it appears to me that Many millions of people, perhaps even a few billion, are using it more as a substitute yeah. rather than an addition. Mm. Even when I do stuff on social media, I often use it to do things in real life, mm. right? I'll, I do meetups with my followers in different cities around the world. I might be like, hey, I'm in, I'm in Cape Town. I've seen, yeah. I'm in Cape Town. Who wants to hang out? And what right? sort of response you get from that? Amazing. Is it? I love the Give meetups, me an example. Man. I love that. Oh, wow. Give me an I've, example. I've done, I've done a bunch, man. I've done probably about 20 different meetups now um, in multiple cities and countries. So will you just whack it out on Twitter and go, hey, I'm in... Austin. Austin. Yeah. Come and meet me 7 o'clock. I'm going to be in this bar. More, more um, the merrier. What I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll say, um, I'm going to do, an, I'm gonna do a meetup in Austin this Saturday. Uh, if, you're interested in, if you're interested in hanging out, send me a DM. And I might get... 200 people, 200 people. <laughs> like the Pied Piper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love it. And, and, and it's so funny how it started. The first ever one I did was in that first trip to California in mm. 2019. I was in San Francisco, actually. Uh, it was like 5 p.m. on a Saturday. And I was, I, I tweeted, um, I'm in San Francisco and want to get, anyone want, does anyone want to get dinner? And then, you know, maybe 10 people messaged me. And then within three hours, I was out at dinner with like seven people, seven, seven, ran, seven, seven of my Twitter followers, Amazing. right? And we had a wonderful conversation. Everyone got on well. It was really fun. And then I was like, like that was the spark. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So when I was, um, I did the same thing in Dallas. I did the same thing in New York. I, and mm. and they, they, kept, they started getting bigger, you know? So like, I mean, the biggest one I've ever done, you know, I've done a couple with, you know, 100 plus people. Um, it got to a point <laughs> How'd where- How'd you get was, to a Can I have a- Hundred, please, mate. <laughs> Dude, in in, uh, in in New York in 2021, um, I did two on the same day. I did one in Central Park. There were there were so many people that wanted to come. Actually, the biggest feedback was in New York and L.A. Wow, which is quite interesting. Mm. Um, in both of those cities, several hundred people got in touch. Like it took me actually days to organize the thing. 
because I was like, oh my gosh, like it, it was easy when, you know, a dozen people yeah. want to hang out yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, oh gosh, how do I even, how do I even handle this? So we did one in, in the daytime in Central Park. And then, um, one of my followers owns, owns a restaurant in Brooklyn. And he's like, he's like, yo, do it in my restaurant. I'll give you the whole restaurant. So then, so we went from Central Park and then we had a dinner, like a whole Italian restaurant. Brilliant. Just booked out for Zuby and his supporters. Brilliant. So we had like tables and it was, it was like a dinner. It was, it was, it was amazing. And the owner of the restaurant was a fan. Yeah. So that was beautiful. It's very similar thing happened. I was just in Cape Town in March mm. and, um, I didn't know where to even do the meetup. And, uh, one of my, one of my supporters DM me on Instagram and was like, Hey, I have a cafe. Um, shout out to Stelsky cafe in, in Cape town. Mm -hmm. Uh, she, she messaged me and was like, yeah, do it, do it in, do it in my venue. And she was like, my, my husband and I are both fans. We listen to your podcast. Like we'd love to have you. So I was like, okay, great. And then, you know, several dozen people came and you know, that that's, those are the moments where I'm yeah. just like, this is real. Yeah. Yeah. Mate. Yeah. I, I feel, so, I feel so grateful. Cause I'm just like, man, this is crazy. Yeah. Like I'm, I've never been, I've never been to South Africa before. Yeah. I'm the first time ever in the city, ever in this country. And there's people want to hang out. Mm -hmm. I had in Sydney, 50 plus people, right? I've never been to Australia in my life and awesome. Like these are people who in some way, shape or form, I have helped to make their life better. Yeah. And now they're coming out here on a Saturday afternoon. There's a million things you could be doing, mm -hmm. but you specifically want to call me. Oh, cool. Like Zuby's in my city. Yeah. Let's go hang out. Let's meet. And everyone always gets on so well. Yeah. I've had people like, oh, like, are you worried about security? Are you worried about? It's always like the nice. kindest, nicest people, all ages. People, people come, you, people bring their it kids. It stems from you, mate. Thanks, man. It stems from you. You're a kind-hearted, warm human being. People are just warming can you into tell, you. Can you tell my haters that? <laughs> mate, I don't think you've got many haters. I don't think you have. Unless you said something that I haven't heard, mate. And I follow you. We follow each other, mate. And, I, yeah. you know, I, I think you're doing unbelievably well. Tell me how you're earning money. Sure. Because I'm here in all these different countries you're talking, uh, mm. you've jumped in through. I want to go to 2020. Roll on 2020 because that 20, that last two, three years, you've blown up huge. Mm -hmm. And all I ever see you on Instagram, when we message each other, I'm here, I'm in Toronto, I'm in South Africa, I'm in Australia, I'm in New Zealand. Tell me your journey where you've been on and how you're earning money. Okay, sure. So as I've said, I used to earn mainly earn my money through directly CD sales. Yep. And then it expanded into merchandise and CD sales being my main bread and butter. The But that's pre 2019. That was pre, your, yeah, this yeah, this up yeah. until up until early 2019. Yeah. Um in June 2019 I released a book called Strong Advice: Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. I've been going to the gym since I was 15 years yeah. old. Um I've been through a lot of, you know, cycles of, you know, getting getting bigger and cutting down yeah, yeah, and yeah. trying this diet and this and that. So, I basically wrote the book that I wish for me when yeah. I was 15. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a short book. It's concise. Um, I wrote it. I didn't plan on ever doing physical copies or anything. I just wrote it as an ebook. Yeah. Right. Um, and I put that out June 2019. Um, over 10,000 people have bought it. Brilliant. So that How was much average about $30 mm. average. So I made several hundred thousand dollars mm. from that. That was like the first thing I'd ever done, which is funny from like all the grind I've put in yeah. all this. Like, like that's a lot easier that one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I genuinely I didn't plan. I thought I would have been happy to sell 500 copies. Yeah, I didn't put this out as like a money maker. I just mm. put this out as like, I get a lot of people asking me, "Hey, what's your diet, man? What's yeah. your routine? I'm trying to lose fat. How do I do mm. this?" I was like, well, "Why don't I just put this in an ebook mm. and put it?" And then it was getting so many feedback. And then I started getting people like, "Is there anywhere I can get a physical copy?" Mm. Hey, you know, I don't really like ebooks. Can I get a physical copy? Um, and initially I was like, no. And then I was like, okay, um, I'm going to do a run of physical copies. Here's a pre-order link if you want to pre-order it. But so I started taking pre-orders and, you know, about 250 people pre-ordered it. And so I go and I get 250 copies printed. I'd already sold them by the time they arrive Brilliant. and I just shipped them out. I've now done, I think 13 runs of physical books. And then I started getting people, Hey guys, I like ebook. I like audio books. Yeah. Can I, so when I was in Nashville in 2019, I went to a studio and I recorded in my own voice. You know, I, I read the book out and mm. recorded it. So the so now you know the the ebook is there, the paperback is there. Sometimes um, the audio book is there. So that book, um, it still continues to sell. Yeah, still continues to sell well because it's ever it's evergreen. Yeah. yeah, it's evergreen. So that was like a big that was a that was a good money maker. 
Um, at this point, it's a combination of, you know, all the music stuff that still exists and then, you know, spe live speaking fees, um, book sales. I also invest, like I'm, I invest heavy in Bitcoin. So depending on where it is in the market, mm. like that, that can uh, impact my net worth quite a bit. Um, and then I do uh, coaching and consulting as well. Okay. So I help people to grow their social media followings. Um, I've helped people grow by hundreds of thousands of followers, actually. That's not something I advertise a lot, but I've worked with dozens mm. of clients, both individuals and companies, to help them grow their social media platforms. And um, I've also done some life coaching and fitness coaching mm. and stuff like that. But most of the coaching I do now is more geared around social media. So do you actually those are the main sleep? Pillars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you cram a lot in, Zuvi. Six you hours, 20. You cram... <laughs> Six hours, Dude, 20. Dude, do that. Yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> I'd love to hit seven. Yeah. I hit seven maybe once a week. Yeah, I never get eight. Mm. Never eight. But I don't, also don't need eight. So mm. For me, seven is optimal. But I often fall tell me about short. your guest speaking, your guest talking. Yeah, give an example of five places your biggest guest talks in front of how many people and whereabouts. Okay. Um, so for the past several years, I have spoken at uh, there's an organization called Young America's Foundation. It's the biggest um, conservative student organization in the USA. And I've spoken, they do, a, they do like a landmark annual event every year. And I've spoken the past three years and I'm going to be speaking there next week, mm. actually, in Washington, D.C. So I've done those. Young Americans for Liberty is similar, but libertarian organization, mm. biggest libertarian student organization. I've, I've spoken at several of their events. Um, I've spoken, I speak at Bitcoin conferences. Um, I spoke at Bitcoin 2023. Just that was just in Miami. Is that a passion for you, Bitcoin? I love Bitcoin. You do? Yeah, yeah. Which, what, what have you bought? What have I bought? Yeah, Bitcoin. Mm. Just Bitcoin. Also just Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, yeah, just Bitcoin. Yeah. Have you had a look at Dogecoin? Have you had a look I, at I've the had a look at all of them. Yeah, I mean, when, I, when I or anything. Yeah, when I first got into it in you know 2017. Yeah, and then did you jump in on 2017? Did you? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that's when top of the bull market was just going crazy, mm. and you know everything was just number going up, and I. I hadn't really at that point learned all the differences between them and, you know, what it really means. But the longer time you spend in the market, uh, the more people tend to gravitate primarily towards Bitcoin. Mm. Um, That's what I've chucked in at. Yeah. Just stuck with Bitcoin and I yeah. bought it and said, so you know, I'm not going to look at it for five years. Yeah. I don't wise. know what it is today. Good. Wise. I haven't got a clue what it is today, <laughs> but I bought a nice chunk yeah. two years ago. Okay. And I'm just going to sit and wait. Good man. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, that's very wise. Yeah. You know, don't, don't get so emotionally involved, no, but, I um, can't. yeah, that's, that's a, te that's another technology that, that I think is going to, uh, that's a technology I'm very optimistic about mm. in terms of changing the world for better. Um, because one of the biggest issues we have in every single nation at this point is just the fiat money system. Is the what, sorry? The fiat money system. Go on. I mean, the money is infinite. Mm. It's all just central bank printed tokens, no longer backed by anything because no currency I'm aware of is backed by gold anymore. Yeah. Right? We could, I think every country went off that. I mean, I know in the US it was 1971, they went totally off it. I don't know the year the U.S. the U.K. the British pound went off it. Mm. You know, British the money is called pound sterling because you know it used to be tied to I believe it was pri priced on the sil sterling silver, right? Yeah. So it all yeah. used to be backed by something real. Yeah. So the reason for so for everyone right now who's worried about you know inflation, mm. monetary inflation is just an increase in the money supply. So the more you increase the money supply, the more you know in the in the USA you have the Fed, in the U.K. you have the Bank of England, mm. the more pounds they print the less each one is worth yeah right so just just think of basic supply demand yeah. economics if they go out there and they doubled the money supply that would mean that every pound that exists is now worth half of what it was mm. previously mm. so when you see prices going up in shops or prices going up in services whatever it is it's better to think of it as the value of your pound or dollar going down mm. rather than the price going oh, okay. up because that's really what's happening. Yeah. So when my dad first came to the UK, my dad's a medical doctor. Mm. Here's a fun story. My dad's a medical doctor for the NHS. Um, when he first came to the UK in the 1970s, what do you think his annual salary was? 10 grand. Four grand. Four grand. Wow. 4,000 pounds. Wow. In the 1970s. Mm. Mm. As a medical doctor. Mm. Family of, I think it would have been fa family of five at the time, mm. soon to be seven. Um, 4,000 pounds used to be a good salary, right? If you go back further, you know, there would have been a time where 100 pounds mm. per year was a good salary. So the reason why 
you have to, you know, everything gets inflated. Every price, every number just keeps on going up is because the value of the pound just keeps on dropping and dropping. A pound now is worth like 1% of what it used to be. So, so what's Bitcoin going to do? What's so, Bitcoin okay. going to do f- for the world? All right. So, yeah. okay. So, so fundamentally, the massive difference between Bitcoin is Bitcoin is the first. So f- firstly, in terms of what Bitcoin is, let me just assume, you know, a listener doesn't mm-hmm. know what it is. Bitcoin is a digital currency that is fully decentralized, meaning it is not owned or run or issued by any nation nor central bank. Yeah. It's also the first digital anything that is limited in supply. Yeah. If you think prior to Bitcoin, anything digital was always infinite. Yep. Yeah. Right. If you have a photo Mm. and you send it to me, Mm. you don't lose the photo. You still have the photo. You just create a copy, send Mm. it out. PDF, copy, send Mm. it out. A Mm. Word document. doesn't matter what it is. An MP3. People have always thought of digital things being infinite. Mm. Right. Bitcoin is limited to 21 million. There will never, ever, ever be more than 21 million. Is that right? Is it? Yeah. Wow. So Bitcoin, there are about, it's estimated there's about 55 million, 55 million millionaires in the world. Yeah. I believe. I think that's somewhere around that. 55, 60 million millionaires. There's not enough Bitcoin in the world and never will be for every millionaire to own one. Okay. Bitcoin is rarer than gold. Bitcoin is one of the rarest things that exists. So the reason why one Bitcoin has gone... So, you know, you used to be able to buy 100 Bitcoins mm. for one pound. Now... You know, I know you said you don't know the I price, don't wanna, but I, I don't think, want to hear. It, but go oh, on, yeah. say but, it. But now. okay, well, you go know, on, say it. One, say it. One Bitcoin's one how Bitcoin. Much? I think today sterling about twenty pound. about twenty five twenty five grand about twenty five thousand pounds, okay. right? So the reason why that happens is because if the supply cannot be increased and the demand goes up, the price ha- must go up. Yeah. Right. So rather than having a fiat currency where you know you know ten years from now every pound you have is going to be worth less yeah. than it is today, yeah. guaranteed. Yeah. Right. It's going to keep on declining in value. Bitcoin is the opposite, is deflationary, right? Mm-hmm. As long as the demand for it continues to increase, then the price is going to continue to grow up. So in ter- from the investor perspective, that is the, that, that's the sort of, uh, pro- that's, a, that's a primary attraction to Bitcoin from a monetary perspective. But in terms of what it can, can do for people around the world is bank, unbanked people. There are still mil- billions of people in the world who don't have bank accounts. Mm. With Bitcoin, you don't need a bank account. You can transact just off of a phone. All you have, you, you just set up your address. People can send you money. If you think of all the money that gets sent, think of like remittance. Mm. Think about com- uh, companies like, what's that one? Western Union, yep. yeah, yeah. you know, where they might charge you 8%. And they send it around and, the world. Yeah, to, to send your money. Yeah. Say, you know, say you're working in... You're working in Dubai and your family's in Pakistan and you want to send them money and you have to deal like it's it's all annoying with Bitcoin. It's just it's fast. It's quick. You don't have to uh, go through any intermediary party. It's just person to person. Mm. It's almost like uh, it's, it's like, almost like cash. Like Revolut. Um, kind of. We money to your mates or. Yeah, but Revolut is still part of, part the, of the, it's your still, bank, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's still, it's kinda, it's still uh, just yeah. running off the fiat system. Yeah. Right. So it's important for people to know that. I mean, every. Pounds, dollars, euros, like they're not backed by anything. Mm. They're all just backed by our trust. We don't know how many are even printed every year, every day, every day. Like right now, new pounds are being put into yeah. circulation. We don't know how many. Mm. We don't know at what rate. Like we we don't we don't know. Like there's this black. And is that box. why you love Bitcoin so much? Because you know there's a certain amount of Bitcoin. It's a it's a, it's a set amount. Okay. And it works. The the network is essentially unhackable. Yeah. The network has never been hacked before. Um, and it's, it's real, it's, it's money for the people. It's, it's like power back to the people. The truth is gold was much better than what we have today. Yeah. Gold was, gold is a much better currency. I've always liked gold. Yeah. Yeah. Gold is a much better currency than dollars, than Mm. pounds, than euros or whatever. It's supply is much more fixed. Um, it, it has the qualities it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard money. It's sound money. Um, it's divisible. You can carry it around. So the problem with it, you know, it is it is heavy. <laughs> it is weight, you know. Um, so for me, I view Bitcoin, you know, some people don't like this term, but I, I view Bitcoin almost like a digital gold, but with yeah. properties that make it even better. And we're talking about when, when you think of the upcoming generations who are growing up as digital natives, um, you know, I think gold will always have its value proposition. But I think that for younger people, say, especially someone who's like under 25, um, the proposition for Bitcoin is going to be a lot more attractive to them 
than say gold. Yeah. And yeah. gold might be the ne- like the next best, the next layer below competitor yeah. to it. So that's partly why that you know I, I could go on for a long time, mm. but that that's why I'm so bullish on Bitcoin. Invested and it, yeah. and when you look at around the world, you also have to remember that you know in the U in the UK and in many Western countries, where comp- people are complaining about you know five percent, ten percent, maybe fifteen percent inflation. Mm. Mm. You have to remember that there's many nations around the world where the inflation rate yeah. is like eighty yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meaning, if you if you store, imagine you work, you work a job, mm. you work very hard, mm. and let's say you store the equivalent of one thousand, you save one thousand pounds, mm. and the next year, it's worth two hundred. Mm. In terms of what you can buy with it, it's worth two hundred yeah. pounds. Yeah, that is broken. How mm. can you how can you exist? How mm. can a, how can an economy flourish mm. where you can't even you can't save money? Mm. Like my I'm. Uh, you know, I'm I'm Nigerian as well as British. Right now, so if you go back a few decades ago, uh, the Nigerian currency is the Naira. Yeah. The Naira and the pound, I believe, used to be one to one. Today, one pound is worth over 1,000 Naira. Right? Mm. And like a couple years ago, it was 500. Then it went to 600, mm. 700, 800. Nine. So if you're earning, and, and the Naira is not the worst. I mean, if you saw what happened with Zimbabwe's currency, mm. you know, a Go couple decades Jesus. ago, right? Yeah. Where, where you, they, were, they were issuing $500 trillion yeah. notes yeah. and you couldn't buy a loaf of bread with yeah. it. Right? They, they just had hyperinflation. To this day, Zimbabwe, I don't believe, has its own currency. Mm. It, they never recovered from it. So whilst for people in, I don't know, UK, Canada, Australia, UK, you know, places that are more stable and which have a, you know, have, have inflation, but it's... It, it's slow enough that like you feel the pain a bit, but yeah. it's not like so painful mm-hmm. that you you need to, you know, I think for people in, in those countries, it can be the sort of value proposition of Bitcoin can be a little harder to understand, yeah. especially given its own price volatility. Well, I think what you're doing is to any listeners out there to actually understand Bitcoin. Yeah. Because your normal bod out there is just thinking this weird thing's going to be coming soon. Bitcoin, yeah. we've got it now. What's going to be happening, et cetera. Mm. I think a lot of people don't actually know that it's fixed supply. And yeah. another thing people need to know is that well, it's- That's powerful to know that. <laughs> it's Jesus, very important. Jesus, like, now I yeah. know that. I just, I just <laughs> put a load of money in it going, oh, everyone's talking Bitcoin. I whack it and yeah. I close my eyes for five years. Because and... also you brought up all the other cryptos. Yeah. Most of them don't have this property. Okay. Right? What, Dogecoin? Dogecoin's infinite. Ether- infinite, okay. It's infinite, right? So there's no dogecoin's just just b- there's billions and billions yeah, and more okay. billions are going to be made right so i actually bought a bit of dogecoin because i've yeah. got dogecoin i was thinking but yeah yeah <laughs> just, to, <laughs> yeah. just to see what happens but yeah. yeah yeah so with those ones you know they're, they're driven by like market hype and you know memes and tic- hype, tiktok yeah. Pop- yeah, popularity yeah. and things but the true true value proposition is is like gold you know it's like there's lots of metals out there yeah you know but if you if you're a gold bug or you're someone who holds gold Someone's like, oh, well, what about aluminium? It's lighter, yeah. it's silver. cheaper. Yeah, 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 whatever, yeah you know, yeah. So, silver is good too, but silver's always been number two. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because it has many of the properties of gold, but not all of them. And yeah. it's not as rare. Yeah. Right? So there's gold and silver, but, you know, there's all these other metals. But if someone's like, oh, what about tin? What about copper? Mm. What's well, like, no, I want gold. Mm. Like gold, like co- copper has a purpose, mm. but gold is gold. And it's been like that for thousands of thousands yeah. of years. There's never been another metal, yeah. really. Mm. Not even platinum. Like mm. people, like gold is... Gold is gold. It's gold is yeah, gold. Yeah, and it always will be. Yeah. What you thought, see Rishi Sunak today talking about universities ripping off students with some weird and wonderful courses. What mm. are your thoughts on this whole university movement, really? What's happened over the years? Because when we were at university years ago, it was actually worth something. A piece of paper was actually worth something. Mm. Even though I've never used it because I've just been throwing parties and stuff. But <laughs> actually, going to a sports uni actually has given me a load of contacts and I get that. But it didn't cost us anything back 20 years ago. So I'm seeing students now doing a degree, spending nine thousand pounds a year yeah. for a three-year degree, twenty-seven grand on a degree that someone's reading from a book that was written twenty years ago. Times are moving so fast. I'm thinking mm. the average student's leaving university with fifty thousand pounds worth Is of debt. Is that the average now? Average now in the wow. UK. Okay. Fifty grand's worth of debt. Okay. So they finish their A levels. The teachers are pushing them to go to uni. Mum and dad are pushing them to go to uni. But actually, the uni courses aren't very good. Mm-hmm. And that's why this online, that's why we've created an online events course. Oh, yes. To compete because we know we brought 40 of the world's leading industry experts in from Glastonbury, from the Olympics, mm. da, 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 to teach people in three months online, all, pre, all pre-recorded all pre versus going to uni and coming at 50 grand's worth of debt. So you can do that. ours in three months at three grand and we'll open up the doors and the contacts for you to get into the most exciting industry in the world, which is the events industry. Mm. What are your thoughts on degrees these days? It's a brilliant question. 
And I think actually in your own story, there's some interesting points there. So you said when you, am I right in saying when you went to university, mm. it was free at the point of service, mm. it was taxpayer funded, mm. right? So you didn't have zero tuition fees? Yeah, no, not literally. Okay. When I went to university, 2004 to 2007, it was 3,000 pounds a year. Yeah. From 2007 to 2023, we're now up to 9,000 yeah. pounds a year. Yeah. So the price is going up mm. and the amount of debt people are coming in is going up. Simultaneously, the value of that degree Get in down. real world terms is declining. Yeah. So that's not sustainable. So the whole, I think basically at this point, you know, unless you're going to do a STEM degree or you get a scholarship, mm -hmm. I don't recommend university for most people. Same. And, um, you know, there might be some exceptions to that, but for them. Veterinary. Yes. Yes. Law. Yes. There's a couple, right? There's, yeah. if, if you're going to a vocation where, you know, you absolutely need that degree and, um, you know, there's no other way to get it, mm -hmm. then. Yeah, you know, if you if you want to be a an engineer, yeah, please yeah. do get a good degree. Yeah. But if you want to be an events manager, yeah. you you don't really need don't it. need one, right? Yeah. It's just it's it's very expensive. I, I've said to people before that um, and th this is now, oftentimes people say that education is expensive, and I correct them, mm. say no, university is expensive. Yeah, education is cheap. Yeah, very. <laughs> education is cheaper free yeah. now, it, and this is new. Like, this is something again uh, that I don't think people have realized. I agree. People have not yet realized that the uh, we now, information has been so democratized. Mm. Education has been democratized before. I mean, who could even, if you go back far enough, I mean, who could even, who could even afford books, let alone read yeah. them, yeah. right? You had to be in the elite class. Mm. Then, you know, okay, Gutenberg Press, cool. Everyone, mm. everyone can have books. Amazing. Everyone can read, you know, literary, literacy rates go up. Now we've got this thing called the internet mm. and you've got YouTube mm. and you've got podcasts and you've got courses and you've got eBooks and you've got all of these You've got things. Siri. Yeah. You can ask anyone anything within seconds, get your yeah. answer. If you yeah. want if you want if you now want to look, thirty years ago, if you wanted to learn how to program, you wanted to be a software engineer, you you've got to go to university. Yeah. You've got to spend four years studying computer science, coding, all that. You can now go go on Google and type you know, whatever language you want to learn, how to learn C, how to learn Python, whatever it is. And you can find whole courses, you can find YouTube channels yeah. literally teaching you. Yeah how to code. You want to learn how to be a YouTuber. There's YouTube channels teaching you how to be yeah. a YouTuber. Yeah. You want to start a podcast like this, right? You can learn something, how to start a yeah. podcast and you can learn from it. You can also follow people who are doing it and you can ask them. You can literally ask the person, hey, uh, what kind of microphone do you use? Yeah. For Oh, I've seen those sure mics. Like, yeah. you know, what, what's that microphone? Or how did you do X? How did you scale? Oh, I, I saw you, you know, you went from this to this. How yeah. did you do it? So the amount of information that's out there for free mm. or for cheap is incredible. Yeah. I think the one thing that is um, that's going to change the game, and I don't know how they're going to do this, because the one thing that I think the traditional university and degree structure currently has, um, beyond inertia, above these other methods, is accreditation. Mm. Right. So I have an Oxford University. I have a degree. I have an accreditation from Oxford University. Mm. If I ever wanted a real job, which I don't, absolutely not the. I, I abhor the concept. <laughs> what did you get? <laughs> what degree did you get? Uh, Computer science. What did you end up with? Oh, I just, I just missed out on a two one. You just missed out on two one. I just missed out on a two one. Yeah. I got a Desmond. I got a two. Oh, yeah? two. oh yeah, I got a two two. Is it, oh Desmond. Science. Oh, you know when you said a Desmond, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, two. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was, I was annoyed at the time. Oh, really? I was, happy. I was annoyed. I was at over the moon. Oh really? Two. Yeah, no, absolutely. no, I was aiming, I was aiming for a two one, and I had like one particular exam that mm. like massively. Massively dropped it. All, do you know what? Do you know what's but, also, but also to be fair, yeah. like computer science at Oxford is freaking, freaking hard. hard. I was going to say, <laughs> like, I was doing it's, sport. It's, fr <laughs> it's, it's freaking hard, right? Like yeah. it's actually like very. Do you know difficult. what's funny though? The university yeah. degree, like when I was doing it, I was paying because I was putting on student nights while at uni, so mm. I was taking the dorm money, two three grand a week on my final year from the nightclub. And what's funny is I was paying the clever kids who were getting firsts and da, 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 to do all my coursework for me. So what's interesting now is in real life. I'm still paying all the real clever people to all around me. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly the same, but it's just yeah. bigger scales, you know? Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean if you're super intelligent, you are going to do well in life. No. It really doesn't. No, no, not, 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 not at all. Um, but I think if the, if the online alternatives mm. can work out the accreditation, and I think, look, some of it is also just going to be time because the truth is most people who are, let me say, 50 plus, they have... Um, because of their own experience, especially if they themselves are graduates, mm. 
I think a lot of older people, and the older they are, perhaps the more true this is for the most part, they haven't realized just how much it's changed, Yeah. right? They think, look, a degree, a yeah. university, higher education, this yeah. is the pathway to success. Yeah. Because there was a time period, there was a period of decades where really it, it, it was. That piece of paper will get you that corporate job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it has changed. There's as more I said, entrepreneurs. The price ever. has gone up. Yep. The value has gone down. The amount of alternatives mm. has increased. And also um, employers mm. are catching on to this, especially companies that are run actually by younger people mm. are like, wait, it's not really just about the degree. Yeah. It's can you do the job? Yeah. Can you do the job? And do you have a personality Agreed. that fits in with the thing? If someone ever wanted to work for me or mm. do something for me, I don't care about your Same. degree. I've all. got 12 full-time staff here across yeah. the three businesses, the festival, the mm -hmm. podcast, and the online events course. I don't care if you've got a degree or not. doesn't matter. Are you good with people? Are exactly. you sharp? Are you? Can you write a good email? Yeah. yeah. Are you so, kind? Are you so, easy to work with? So, all the rest yes. of the stuff we can teach you. Exactly. You know? And there will come a time in the next decade or two mm. where every other employer realizes that. Yeah. And they find that, okay. I think okay. it's catching on quickly at yeah, the moment. I, I think yeah. so too. I think so too. So, you know, just from a free market perspective, it will balance out, right? Either the price of a degree is, is going to have to, yeah. is going to have to come down or they're going to have to like offer something much better mm. or whatever it is, because the amount of parents or individuals who are just like, yeah. you know, either sending their kids or they themselves going and putting themselves in tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands yeah. of debt to get this piece of paper, they'll catch on. Unfortunately, like millions of people are going to be saddled, you know, with, with this debt, but eventually more and more people will catch on. And I also think this is one of the issues mm. that um, this is something that I have changed my mind on very significantly mm. in the past 15 years. If, if we had this conversation in uh, 2009, you know, different. I would yeah. have said, yeah, I think, you know, most people should get a degree and whatever. And then just in that time period, it's like, man, the world has changed yeah. so much that and the, and the cost of it, like, since I graduated, the mm. cost has tripled. Yeah. That's a big difference. It's a huge difference. That's a big difference. Three grand to nine grand a year. Yeah. Nine grand over three years to 27 grand. That's that's a significant difference. And the rents have gone up and yes. everything else has gone up. Yes. So that's why they're leaving with 50 grand's worth of debt. It, exactly. it pains me. Yeah, because then you also have to factor in, and then you also have to factor in the opportunity cost. Mm. What have you spent three or four years doing? Mm. Right? Say, say you do want to be in get into event management. Mm. Would it be better that you do, uh, you know, your three month course? Mm. You know, online. Three month online in course. In your own time. Yes. Yeah. And then three or four years of real work. Yeah. Or you just go and you do an events management degree. Yeah. I know which, which yeah. person I'd rather hire. I agree. Right? Totally agree. I know which person. Like, They're missing like, out on three, four years experience. That's what I mean. We have kids who come work here at 18. Yeah. I would take an 18 year old who's hungry mm -hmm. than a 21 year old who's got an event degree because events degree is not really even teaching them much. Yep. And in that There's time, no experience and in stuff. that time, instead of getting saddled with debt, you could have been earning some money, yeah. right? Yeah. So it might, you might you might not be loads to begin with, mm. but you're earning some money. You're earning. You're rather earning than losing. Yeah, you're earning rather than losing, mm. and you're also earning the real world experience. Yeah. And, and you know, I think with almost any job, like again, there are exceptions to this, but with most jobs that are not like very specifically technical, you know, you're a structural engineer or you're a, you know yeah. a surgeon, you know, you're a yeah. you know medicine law. Um, you know, some, si yeah, science yeah, in yeah. general. Um, there, you know, there are certain specific ones where it's like, all right, like you're gonna struggle to get this full body of information and do the practical stuff without going to university. The, the, the bad thing is, is no one's spoken up about this. And today, yeah. Rishi Sunak has spoken up about it. That's interesting. He's spoken up saying that the universities are ripping off the students. That's good. How good is that? I think it's great. I think it's amazing. I actually replied to one of his things on LinkedIn <laughs> today and I wrote a big piece on it and everyone's all over it. It's, yeah. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I, th I think it's good. You need someone to, with a pair of kahunas to go, no, we have to stop. This is too much debt going on. Mm. I, th I think I think it's good. You know, there's, dude, we live in such an interesting time. Mm. I mean. Exciting times. Na name, name of the podcast, right? But I think, I think th we're at the, this next, this century. Mm is going to really be mm. a fascinating one. Mm. If you think of how much of the world, think of, I mean, it's hard to even fathom. Mm. 100 years ago was 1923. Mm. 100 years is, 100 years sounds like a really, really long time, but that's like, that's one long lifetime. I often think of, uh, I find when I look at things in history, I like to think of like how many people ago they are rather than how many years, because it, it frames things better. Say that again, how many? How many people ago? 
Okay. Okay. So example. Okay. So say something happened in um, uh, seventeen fifty. Yeah. You could say. Oh, I see. How many sets of people yeah, would so have lived those lives? Seventeen oh, fifty. Okay. If yeah. you say it, it sounds like yeah. ages yeah. ago, ages and ages ago. If you think, okay, let's say, let's say a lifespan of eighty years. Yeah. Call right? it a hundred for easy sums. Seventeen fifty, eighteen fifty, nineteen fifty. Yeah. So you could say it's like let's say it's four. Let's say it's, let's say it's four. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say four, roughly. Yeah. Four people ago. Yeah. <laughs> Four That's people. A great way of looking you, at it. you see what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it makes it things. It makes things much more recent. Yeah. If you think of World World War Two, mm. that was one person ago. Mm. That was one person ago, right? If someone says 1940s, it's, oh man, like, God, that's, that's my nan. That's yeah, my that, nan, isn't it? Right? But, yeah. but then you're like, wait, like there's people alive right yeah. now who lived, who lived through that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like there's people alive right now. I mean, not many now, but you know, who who saw World War One and World War Two, mm. right? Maybe they were babies in mm. World War One, but like. There, all this happened in their lifetime. Think of um, how old was the Queen when she passed away? Ninety nine was it, or did she hit a ton? Was she? Did she not hit a ton. Uh, you know, I what, don't know. Do you, she, do, what, what? She was born in the nineteen twenties. Wasn't she? Was have a look. Born, I'm she must. To see. She must have been born in the nineteen twenties. Yeah. Think, think of everything that she lived. She's through. gone through. And what a Queen, how by ma- the way. <laughs> and how how many prime ministers has she? She was ninety six years 96, old. Ninety six. And what was her birth date? Twenty uh, first of April. 1926. 1926. So th- so 1926. Mm. Just think of how much stuff has happened. What she's from, seen from now. Yeah, like it, it's crazy. Bonkers, like she it? was just she was just there yeah. through throughout it all. Um, and so I think it's interesting to think. Okay, say that some say someone who is a child who's born now. Mm. You know, if uh, you know, if, if I have a son or if mm. I have, have a son or a daughter next year, 2023. Right? It'll take the, the next hundred years on. Yeah, will be oh God, hundred yeah. years later. That's <laughs> 21 24 yeah. 21 23 21 24 that's the same yeah like we can't you you yeah. you can't even fathom I love like that. what like what are, what are they gonna mm. and also keep in mind the oh, so I, I i was born in 1986 mm. and i very much remember the technology mm. of you know especially the the 90s mm. you know late 80s early I 90s. Love the 90s by the way yeah so that when decade I, for me was I, special I, I remember when i was uh you know when i was like a very young child i remember when you couldn't render a circle on a screen mm. if you remember the old video games atari 2600 even the early nintendos you didn't have enough pixels to draw a circle mm. right so if you see the old games and say you're playing football what's the ball it's a square yeah Right, so the ball's a square, and then eventually it became like a hexagon, yeah. and then an octagon, yeah. and then it eventually got to a, like that's in my lifetime. Yeah, right. You see, like the mo- um, I remember the original the, mobile the ori- phone. The, 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 they had the briefcase yeah. with the yeah, wire yeah. with the cable. Yeah, and you had to carry the briefcase mm. and the, the giant thing, and then mm. even like the the. I mean, when I was in school, it was all Nokia, mm. right? No smartphones. I used to love a Nokia, by the way. Nokias were great. Snakes. Se- se- seven, yeah. seven day battery life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, this is just when I was in school. And you could like, swap batteries with your mate. If you want yeah. like 2%, swap it swap over. It. But, yeah. Swap it over, pop it out. <laughs> and, and so I'm just like, you know, I'm not some old man. Yeah. And I'm like, man, in my own lifetime. And now I look at PS5 mm. and the graphics. Like, So you've gone from like stick figures, fo- fo- football game, yeah. football game in 1989, yeah. right? Stick figures running yeah. around, kicking a square around a thing no no anything and now you can see the sweat and the pores on the skin yeah, and all this and i'm just like and do you know what go on when my future children are let's say when my future children are my age mm. the technology we have right now is going to be the equivalent of what the technology in like the late 70s or 80s yeah you, you see yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I do. Of course, yeah. Of course right. I do, yeah. So, okay. I, I actually, I actually have ten nieces and nephews. So, mm. say like, you know, um, you know, if one if one is five years old, mm. right? When I was five years old, the technology in 1991. You're talking like first Nintendo, mm. right? Super Mario. Mm. Did it? Did it? Yeah, like the first revolution. Duck Hunt. Yeah, revolution. Right? Apple II e computers. That was like the top technology. At that time, so so what we have right now, for my five year old nephew, yeah. when he's my age, like all the he's going to be talking they're, about they're, this. They're, they're going to be looking at the tech where you. They're going to be like, yeah. what, what is this? Yeah. Like That's just, so far just, behind. <laughs> just like we see these massive mobile phones with yeah. the, with the massive antenna, and I, we're like, you what know is what? This? I always said I'm never going to let person go when I was a boy. <laughs> but do you know what? The other day I just come back from Croatia yesterday with my boy and my wife, and I was telling my boy that 
I used to have a fishing rod in my bedroom because there was only four channels and I'd get the fishing rod extension just to change the channel because you didn't have you didn't have remote control back then did you you had to press yeah. the button and get up and stand up and yeah and the yeah. the t the tv the, you know the the CRT CR, CR, TV yeah. right with the the fat I remember when the first flat screens came out yeah I remember when I was in school they were expensive when they first came oh, out yeah I remember when I was in school I remember um one of my friends was like one of the first people to have like a DVD player portable DVD mm. player and like that was crazy I remember mm. you know, then we had mini discs yeah then we had MP3s mm. I was like and I'm just like man like it, it's weird because you you I think year by year you don't really notice the technological shift do you but when you when you look at decades then you go back yeah. yeah what are your thoughts on time like i'm a big i work hard <clears throat> to slow time down mm. like i really want to slow it down because i never want to be those people go god you know it's a very blase thing people go oh time flies time flies time flies i don't like that comment at all so i try to slow time down and really slow and enjoy the day mm. and i've got a real simple thing that i've got in the kitchen i've got this wooden block that has the date that you have to move over so it'd be the 6th day, whatever the date is today, the 17th of July. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. And each day I move the block over and I think, and that makes me realise that I'm not losing time. Because mm. I acknowledge that day. That may be a weird thing that I'm going through. No, no, no. I've been, no, doing, I've been, doing, it for, I've been doing it for years. And, okay. and it's really slowed time down for me to really enjoy the moment yeah. rather than just speeding up. What's next? What's next? What's mm. next? What's next? And another thing that I was huge for me and I really enjoyed the pandemic and everything, not all the, not all the people dying, et cetera, et cetera, but I really enjoyed it because it made me stop mm. and it made me look at the past and made you realize what's really important around you yeah. and to slow time down and slow yourself down. Yeah. I hated that period, but, um, did you hate that period? <laughs> did you? Passionately. Did you? Passionately. It makes me angry to even think about it. Um, but in terms of time, Man, I, I think that's a really interesting, it's an interesting question. Mm. I've never, I've never really thought about it that much. One thing I do think about and actually which drives me quite a lot, mm. and it might sound morbid to some people, but actually it's not. But I do think I'm very, very conscious of like my own and other people's mortality. Mm. I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm going to die and everyone else around me, everyone I know and love is going to die. I'm very conscious of that. I'm very conscious of it, but I don't like it. I don't like that. Thought. No, I don't like it, but it actually, it improves my, it makes me treat myself and other people better. Yeah. It makes me do everything better because I'm, I think about it. You know, there's an end game. You know, everyone's yeah. going to die. I agree. Yeah. yeah and, I agree. and, and I don't, and I don't know when. So, all, all for, so it motivates me because like all the things I do, people are like, oh, you're doing so many things. I'm like, mm. yeah, I'm going to die, man. Yeah, same. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pile it all in as much as yeah, I can. I'm, I want to be the best version of me every day. Exactly. And do as much as we can to leave a legacy that, yes. rather than just be forgotten as another person. Yeah, exactly. You know, And like, podcast is a great thing for that because this is evergreen. It lives forever. Yeah. Well, it's going to live longer than this you. This conversation is going to live forever. Yeah. And who knows when we're brown That's bread, an, people dude. are listening to this going, do you remember that convo with Zuby and Dodge? Mm -hmm. had? Dodge, <laughs> let me tell you something else that is a complete game changer that no one else thinks about. Yeah. This is the first time slash generation where all of your descendants, everyone who comes after you, not just even in your own family, but in the world, is now forever going to be able to see you, hear you. You know, if, if you, you know, we don't have a photo of Jesus. We yeah. don't have a photo of like all these, yeah. when, when you're looking back in history, you know, Henry, we don't have a photo of Henry VIII. Mm. We have paintings. Yeah. Like, okay, he sort of looked like, right. It's only since when, when was photography invented? Mm. Not even two hundred years the ago. One with the thing over his head. Yeah, yeah, not not even two hundred years, right? Mm. Right. What about video? Mm. Now, this is the first time where every single thing, like think about social media, think about all, all the photos, all the videos, all the podcasts, everything. This is going to live on forever. Yeah. Right. A thousand years from now, my great 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 whatever Can grandson you? could be like. Hmm. That's my that's my well, great 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 granddad. And, and, they, is, yeah. and they can they can pull it all up. Yeah, yeah. And they can see videos. Yeah. And you can they can learn from you. Yeah. I have I don't even know what my great grandfather mm. looks like. Yeah. Same. I don't know what my great let alone my great great like I I, mm. I don't know, right? You go back like just two three generations and like for me it's it's lost. Are you scared? Are you scared of dying? No, not at all. No, not at all. I'm a Christian though, so like uh, maybe that uh <laughs> not maybe that certainly yeah. helps frame it. Um, but you know, I, I have, I've actually seen quite, not firsthand, but I have seen and experienced quite a lot of death. Mm. Um, what people it, around you or friends? Or? I'm from a big family. Yeah. I've got a really big family. Mm. You know, my dad is one of 11. Mm. You know, my mom was one of seven. He's one of 11. Yeah. My God. I'm one of five. So, you know, I have 50, uh, 50 something first cousins. Yeah. 
You know, I have, I don't know how many of my cousins have died. Mm. A lot of my cousins have died. Mm. So many of my aunts and uncles have died. All of my grandparents have died, you know? So I've seen lots of deaths in the family, lots of family friends. Like one of the, this is something no one ever really sort of talks about, about being from a big family. Mm. It has so many positives and benefits. I love being from a big family, but you see a lot of, you see a lot of death. Yeah, of course. You got, yeah, yeah, you see a lot of death. Even that's people. a lot higher for people. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. If, if you know, the more people you know, yeah. or the more people you're related to or connected to, especially once you get past a certain age, right? Because people get older mm. and you get to a certain age where it's like every year, you know, almost every couple months, it's like, man, someone, someone is passing away. And so it makes it that much more, that much more real, mm. that much more real. And you're just like, okay, you know, that we know, we know deep down, of course, our time is limited, mm. but it's like, oh, wow. Okay. You know, that person they they, they reach yeah. that, that's why people even get feels i think that's even why people feel such a way when um you know even if you don't know uh say there's some celebrity you connect to they could be a musician mm. they could be an athlete mm. they could be an actor whatever maybe you grew up you grew up with them and you mm. love their work and maybe you never even met them but you feel like something really close to them it's why it's you know because sometimes people are like I've seen people be like, oh, I don't understand why people get so sad or upset mm. when such some celebrity dies mm. or whatever, you know, you didn't know them, whatever. And I'm like, you're you're kind of missing the point, right? If someone has been, you can, someone can be a very key part of, of your, your life. life. I agree. Yeah. And influence you and inspire you. And, and you might even you, know them. And you, and you don't know mm. them, right? So if that person passes away, it, you know, you. if, yeah, it feels yeah. like losing that person. And also it's like, you know, I think pe people, best example of this probably nationally maybe internationally the queen yeah right? how many of us know the queen right like you don't but she's just been there mm. forever your whole life no matter your age mm. you could be 70 years old you could be like 20 you could be 12 and she, she's on the money she's yeah. on the bank she's, on, she's, she's yeah. on the coins yeah. she's you know the post box you know yeah. have her initials on them she's on the stamps she's just like yeah. you're british yeah you have some type of connection you know, so when she passed away, I think that's why so many millions of people around the world were, affected. were just like, whoa, like that's the end. Of that's a huge year of, of an era. Yeah, yeah. You know, what are your thoughts on sugar, sugar, sugar and obesity? <laughs> because I look here that we train, yeah. we eat clean, we yeah. eat well. We're probably 80, 20 of eating clean or yeah. maybe something 90 to whatever we whatever we decide to do. I'm trying not to put sugar in our bodies. How unfortunate is it or how bad is it for people consuming so much sugar to what it's doing to their internals and also to their minds? Um, I mean, I, I'm going to answer in a not, not a super scientific way, but mm. I think it's a bigger, it's tons of sugar, especially processed sugar is, is generally not good. Um, but it's even more detrimental to someone who is sedentary. If you're very active and you train a ton, yeah. you can, get you, away. You, yeah, you can, yeah. you can get away with more yeah. calories in general, yeah. um, and also more sugar, right? If you eat a Snickers bar and then you go and you smash out yeah. a workout or you smash out a workout and then eat a Snickers bar, Fine. it's not, you know, yeah. whatever. Right. But if you're sitting down on your butt all day yeah. and banging not moving, and you, and yeah, and you're just eating crisp and you're loading Biscuits, up on sugar yeah. and so on, yeah. then that's when because of you know because of the way it's going to spike your blood sugar mm -hmm. you know that's when you're going to be putting yourself it's long term more at risk of diabetes you know obesity etc because you're having both the extra calories mm. and you're also consistently spiking your blood sugar to the point that you can develop type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. because your body becomes more insulin resistant resistant yeah more mm -hmm. insulin resistant so yeah, those those are my thoughts. I'm not. Um, Have you noticed between being in the UK and the US that there's more obesity in America? Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. So when you are clocking, are you yeah, seeing? You see it. You do, do you? Yeah, okay. you see it. Yeah, just go to an airport. Go to go to like any public area where you just kind of um, are, are sort of seeing a general gist of the population. It could be Walmart. It could be an airport. It could be a concert. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Do, do you know what I've noticed actually? Um, in in my personal observation, I don't know the actual statistics about this, but I'd say. The difference in uh, the rate of or percentage of people who are overweight in the UK and US, I don't think is that different. Okay. But the people who are fat in the US are much fatter. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Right. So the is that, the, is that the super king size me everywhere? Yeah. The portions. So, so, yeah. So way bigger portions. I, I, okay. The biggest factors are, I think, um, you the 
sheer size of stuff, right? Like the, the restaurant meals are gigantic. Mm -hmm. Servant size and portions are, are just generally much bigger there. Mm -hmm. um, you have also the food itself is the food itself. The ingredients are different. You've got high fructose corn syrup in yeah. so many things. You've got way more seed oils and yeah. weird additives and colorings and preservatives. Yeah, yeah you've yeah, just yeah. got you've just got all sorts of stuff that's way more in the food there mm -hmm. than it is, say, in Europe or even mm -hmm. in Australia and so on. Um, much more sedentary lifestyle in many parts of it. So one of the differences between U.S. and European cities is every, in Europe and including the U.K., every city is built on human scale. Mm. In the U.S., most cities are built on car scale. Most cities are built on car scale. Yeah. Go on. Like, have you been to L.A. or Dallas or like, yeah. like, done all of them? Yeah. Okay. Can you do anything without a car? And that's true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, yeah you can't do. Like yeah. you, can't, you can't do anything, and there's yeah. no public transport. Like you have to you jump have, in the car. Yeah, okay. yeah. You drive yeah. everywhere. Yeah. They have drive-through banking, drive-through laundry, they have drive through drive banking. through drive-through everything. Did I? <laughs> I think in Vegas they have drive-through uh, weddings. You can you can they have drive through like like you don't need to get out of your car. A drive through wedding. They have drive through everything. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So the amount of daily steps that people take. Right. Yeah. If you live in I don't know if you live in London, even if you live in Bournemouth, just day to day. Yeah. You walk you around move, yeah. much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only U.S. cities that you can really walk around there aren't that many of them. It's like San Francisco, mm. New York City, um, maybe Chicago, mm. Boston. Most of the cities are kind of urban sprawl. You know, they're designed assuming everyone has a car, mm. right? Because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't build them for they built blocks. They, they, yeah, they yeah, they, okay. they were built for cars. Yeah. It's not like uh, you know if you go to any European city, it's like you know it starts from a pedestrianized yeah. city center and then spreads out yeah. from there, and then you have public transport networks and so on. So your daily step count is typically going to be a lot is going to be a lot higher, which is also mm -hmm. why I think places like New York City and San Francisco do have lower obesity levels than you know, places where you have to drive everywhere. So that's another factor. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the massive pharmaceutical influence is a factor. And then I just think like culturally, um, culturally, it's a little bit different. And yeah, I think, I think the, 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 I'm sure someone could add some additional ones, but I think mm -hmm. those are the, those are the primary factors why you get that kind of like crazy level of obesity over there, which is actually quite rare to see mm. even in the UK, you know, in the UK, so, so in the UK, like someone who's even considered obese by American standards, they're not it's like not. that. What big. is obesity in the UK? What is it? over twenty five percent body fat? There's a there's a level, isn't there? I can't, yeah, I can't there, remember what the facts are. I think, I think, out, I think there's a couple of measures. I think it's BMI over thirty. Yeah. Um, and or I think for a man. But aren't they scrubbing BMI because people just find it complicated to understand? It's simple. It's just comp function of height, height yeah. and weight. Um, it's a good indicator for the vast majority of people. If you're like a super in bodybuilder or a powerlifter or yeah. rugby player or something, it's gonna. It's I, gonna would, I would purely just you. go purely on body fat, right? Yeah. For men aged over thirty. Twenty to thirty-nine, a score of twenty-five percent is classed as obese. Yeah, twenty-five percent. Twenty-five percent body 25 fat. Twenty-five percent body for fat for a man. That is high. Mm. Yeah, you don't but want to be being a fat. Mm. As a woman, twenty-five percent is is okay. Uh, okay. You mentioned San Francisco a minute ago. Mm -hmm. I saw on the I saw the other day the people walk around like zombies. You know the oh, drug. Man. Tell me, have you oh, seen man. the drug? Dude, I was just there, there last. I was there last month. Tell me exactly what's going on in San Fran there, because I oh, saw boy. these. They are walking around like it's, zombies, bent over like zombie world. I've seen it firsthand, man. I've seen stuff in that city I've never seen anywhere else in the world. It is. It wasn't until I went to San Francisco that I had ever seen, in my with my own eyes in mm. person, people shooting heroin, people doing crack people taking fentanyl like i've seen it now like i, I you know i've On seen it oh, yeah like, like people. just right there right there it's um it's not exaggerated and actually i confirmed this last month because mm -hmm. i went to san francisco in 2019 for the first time and i walked around the city and i you know i saw the nice parts but i also saw like the really nasty you know horrible stuff and i was actually curious three years later to think okay i have this image of san francisco in my head um let me take a whole walk around the city. Because yeah. before I did the interview with Elon, it, the interview was in, in the evening. Okay. I had a whole day. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm not taking an Uber. I'm just going to walk around mm. the whole city. And um, yeah, I, uh, I was staying up near the near the waterfront, like the north part of the city. So that area is quite nice. It's called Fisherman's Wharf. So you know, I walked around there, and that was pleasant. And then as I moved towards like 
going towards downtown. And the, the worst district is infamous. It's called the Tenderloin. As you move into that, I was like, oh boy, okay, like I'm starting to, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the, uh, yeah. the really gnarly area. But yeah, you just see people, you see open air drug use. You see people like OD'd just lying on the ground, either not moving or like twitching. Um, you see open air, open air drug dealing, people defecate in the street. Um, it's just filthy. It's disgusting. It stinks. It absolutely reeks. It smells horrible. It smells like urine yeah. and poop. Yeah. Um, and it's it's sad. Honestly, it's sad. Like, and and what's interesting is there's a lot of people who live in San Francisco, especially uh, wealthier people who like they don't they do not they do not go downtown. Yeah. Or I have friends who live in San Francisco, and they literally I've seen stuff they haven't seen. Yeah. Because they're like, dude, why did you even go there? Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, this is like your city center. Yeah. Like, imagine see. you go to Bournemouth city center. Yeah. And it's this mm. dead zone. It's like, well, that's the center of the city. Like, this mm. is downtown. This is where all the, like, the, the shops and mm. stuff. Like, you know, it's it's weird. But I think people there also kind of get used to it. So it can be very weird as an outsider. Because have you ever been? I have. You yeah. have. Okay. Years ago. Thirty years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so not not recently. No, yeah. No, no. So it's really weird because you will just see things that you've never seen in the UK. On all mm. all the places you travel. Mm. You, you've you never, even if you've been to, you know, developing countries, mm. you will see things there that you've just never yeah, seen yeah. before. And I'm just like, this is, this is sad. It's mm. that, the best word I can use to describe it. And what I felt the times I've been there and walked through it is just despair. Yeah. Despair, just, just human despair. And it's sad because I don't know. I mean, it, it it's also very weird sort of politically and financially because as I believe, you can you can fa- someone can fact check me on this, but I believe that the the budget per homeless person in San Francisco is over one hundred thousand dollars per person. One hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars per homeless person mm-hmm. is the annual budget. So how can it be a hundred? How can there be a, say a hundred k per person allocated? Yeah, and this is going on. Yeah, like that. It it doesn't. What make drug sense. did you mention a minute ago? Fentanyl. Yeah. What is Fentanyl. that? Fentanyl. <laughs> Um, is that the drug that's sending, that's sending look, people looking like zombies? Yeah, I, fentanyl is an opioid. So when people talk about the opioid crisis, fentanyl is one of many drugs. So you have to keep in mind, in the USA, over 100,000 people last year died from overdoses. One in three deaths in California under the age of 30 is fentanyl. Okay. That one specific drug, one in three deaths under 30 is that oh one drug. Um, what? I, what, what, what? I believe it's in the same. I'm not an expert. No, um, it's in the, I what believe league is it in? I think it's heroin. In, league. Yes, I think it's in heroin. Okay. But I believe it's 200 times more potent than heroin. My God. Um, like a fatal dose is really not not very high, and it's massively addictive. So it's it's a painkiller. I mm. believe it's a painkiller. So people, it, it can be prescribed to people for pain. Um, I think it's one of many opioids that they often use with like military veterans mm. and things like that, or people suffer with, with different problems. But then it's also a street drug. It, they also lace other things with it. And um, yeah, it's just causing a sort of zombie apocalypse in many cities. And again, I, I want to repeat that statistic of over 100,000 Americans last year died mm. of overdoses. Yeah. 100,000. Mm. One year. One year. And that's. So how many how other many people? Are, well, how many are there in America? 360, 360 million? Three, 330. 330 million, is yeah. it? Okay. 330 million. And the UK is 66 million. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, even when you scale for population, that's still more than quadruple the rate, I wow. believe, of overdoses in the UK. So it's not just, oh, you know, they've got more people. It's like, no, like people are dying at quadruple, mm. quintuple the rate. Um, and it's, it's, it's a shame. It's sad. You know, I, I, the reason I talk about some of these things is because you know, there are certain subjects which I think get they get a lot of talk. Mm. You know, people talk about them a lot. They're very much on people's radars, politicians, in the media, whatever. They're constantly talked about. But then there are things which are, you know, massive issues and problems and concerns. And I, in my personal belief, and I think even you know, just objectively, they're sort of swept under the carpet. Yeah. You know, I think if there were, I don't know, if, if there was something, there are things that kill far fewer than mm. 100,000 people. A year in a single country which are avoidable mm. avoidable deaths um which get a lot more shine and a lot more mm. talk and everyone you know wants to talk about all this and whatever and then you've kind of got this thing going Something on going over on. here Jesus. and you can and you can see it yeah. with your own eyes you yeah. can go to la you can go to san francisco yeah. you can go to portland and you can literally see these people you know 
uh, walking around talking to themselves and like you know just lying it's it's sad. what can they do what can the councils or the government what can they do the states the states well, first of all stop enabling it well how do you stop that well they encourage it that's the crazy part who encourages it so you saying the states are encouraging people yes, to take drugs yes um yeah so man this is this is a whole <laughs> this this is like a whole podcast topic mm. um the more i learn about it like the crazier the crazier it gets okay so if you in most parts of the civilized world or even the uncivilized world if you 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 can't just go out in bournemouth and be shooting heroin in public you'll you'll get where the police will stop you arresting in san francisco people do but I understand where you're coming you, but from. You, you're, not you're, you're, not, you're not going to go to Bournemouth Square yeah. or Bournemouth Gardens, mm. and you've got 20 people there yeah, tying, each, up. tying yeah. each other's yeah, arms yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. All, all like no, yeah. or people just smoking. Like no, mm. you, no, you're not going to see that in any no city in the UK. You're not. You're not going to. You know, there might be in I'm a corner. So I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. In San Francisco, in LA, whatever. It's open. It's a, It's open. It's open, and the police cannot. The police cannot do anything about it. They have their hands tied. It's not even like. You, that's why they even I'm sure you've seen like these tent cities they have you mm. can't do that in the UK you can't just set up tents all around yeah. a whole downtown area and have people just there doing whatever like they they get moved on yeah. you, you can't do it there it's it's not just legal but it's the police are not allowed to interfere basically in places like San Francisco unless unless there's a violent incident, or um, unless unless it's violence, unless you know an, an assault, a shooting um, or something, a sh yeah, the police get the involved. The, yeah, that's yeah. only only in those situations. Drugs, drug dealing, whatever. Go ahead. And because it's so lax, addicts from other states and cities go to California and Seattle and uh, parts of Oregon. To do because number one the climate is nice yeah right the yeah. climate the weather's good yeah it's not like brutal heat or brutal cold mm. at any time of the year and then they're just the the councils and governments they're very very permissive these are like very very left wing very progressive yeah. quote unquote yeah. governments and they even the private property rights extend to the tents and stuff like that mm. so the reason the police can't move people on is because it's like, it's like hey that's their that's private pro that's okay. their private property Jeez. so they're not allowed to interfere with it and so yeah they have they have policies they call the the term they use is harm reduction it's kind of a dystopian uh term but essentially what it largely means is kind of enabling a lot of these behaviors that's what it does in practice they give them clean needles yeah so, so, yeah, yeah they get it you know so they have so how do they stop this then if they took the tents away yeah what would happen they just let they'll just carry on the streets Look, I, it's honestly, it's the the solution is you would need to draw some hard lines. Yeah. Right. Here's another crazy thing, and when I say this, it doesn't even sound real. Mm. In San Francisco, if you steal or cause criminal damage under, it's either nine hundred or nine hundred fifty dollars. It's not a felony. So the shoplifting there is crazy. Mm. The shoplifting is insane. It was in San Fran. Yeah. Mm. If it's under nine hundred dollars, wow. it's not a felony. So, so you, you can go, go and you can go and rob seven hundred dollars worth of stuff. The security guards often won't even try to stop you. So what the, surely that's free for all. Yeah, it is, and that's why so looting. that's why so many stores are have shut down over the past few years. That's why their targets are closing and Whole Foods is closing. And so if you go and rob seven hundred pounds worth of clothes from a sports shop or from or food, or da, yeah. the, no one can do anything to you. Um, it's a misdemeanor, <laughs> assuming you like get stopped and caught and prosecuted and this this goes what, for what, who made that rule up that's that's a stupid rule um and why the, did they make the that local up? the local governments look it's it's very i i know i know where it comes from but it's i come i absolutely disagree with it yeah. socially culturally and politically mm. right so so f take take let's let's take one of them so as, as i understand it, there's a great book i'm gonna i don't often do book recommendations on mm. podcasts but if someone is curious to really learn about this stuff um there's a man named michael schellenberger who people may know of he's got a book he's um he's got a book called san francisco and it's completely about the whole book is about this exact topic Oh um, you know, he lived in he's he lives in San Francisco. He's been there for, I believe, at least two decades. Okay. I don't know if he was born there, 
but um he, and he tells you how it is he explains how and why going back to like the 50s yeah. or 60s how it's become yeah. what it is now the policies the years the policies came in why who voted for them he interviews people mm. people on the street people who help in homeless charities he interviews some of the politicians like it's it's a very revealing book but it's it's bizarre yeah um regardless of someone's views you know conservative liberal whatever they consider themselves what they're doing there is just honestly it's it's crazy it's nonsensical it's like a very utopian view so for example with the drug thing um, they view, so the people in power there, they largely, they, they, they'll often say things like, uh, drug addiction and drug use is not a, a, a criminal issue. It's purely a health issue. So to them, the idea of prosecuting someone because they're doing, or perhaps even dealing drugs in public, or they're doing this or they're doing that to them, that's like in their strange sense of like that that's immoral to them yeah because it, it, it's like you know there are people out there who are so like if you talk to someone who's like ultra again quote unquote progressive i don't consider these yeah. things progressive at all they don't even believe in like criminal justice mm. right they don't think that people should be punished for crimes because they have an idea that you know the only reason people may even commit a crime or do something bad is because there's a problem with the system right or there's a problem with society or whatever it is right it's not that individual's fault per se right so if i go out there and i do something crazy then it's wrong to punish me you know you can you can rehabilitate me yeah. and give me you know give me mental health support yeah. or whatever it is but they don't really believe in punishment like there's people who don't even think jails should exist mm. right because I find they this have bonkers. this very, yeah, I'm finding I, it, this absolutely yeah, bonkers. It, it, it is bonkers. I'll go and rob 700 pounds worth of stuff every day. Yeah. I'll sell it to you for 350 pounds. Mm -hmm. You win, I win. I mm -hmm. get my drugs. Yeah. I use every single day yeah. and cause a huge problem in society living yeah. in San Fran. Yeah, but that's if in in this person's perspective, the people who make these policies and ideas and vote for them, you know, the reason you're doing that is because, you know, you you had a rough childhood or the system mm. failed you or you didn't get enough support with this or whatever. So it would be wrong to punish you. But, you know, maybe we can get you working with a counselor and well, you you need drugs. OK, well, if you're going to do drugs anyway, let's at least get you some clean needles. Right. Okay. Right. And instead so kind of, of like, facilitating it, really, aren't they? Exactly. That, what are your that's thoughts? How it is. What are your thoughts in the UK about the woke society? Big question, man. Um, what what particular aspect of it? Just, do you think the world's gone soft? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Same. I also think, um, I've made this point a few times, and I'll say it again. I think that we have passed the peak of the tolerance of it. Mm. Um, you know, it's interesting. We we talked earlier in the show about, if you want to use like a, an example, we talked about the thing I did in February 2019 mm. with the deadlift mm. to highlight the absurdity of allowing males to simply say that they're yeah. women and, yeah. you know, compete yeah. in women's sports yeah. and the unfairness of mm. that. When I did that, it wasn't on, the issue was on some people's radar, but it wasn't really spoken about yeah. much. Some people, it wasn't even on their radar, right? Mm. They're like, that's not happening. It was happening, mm. but people, people were not seeing it, right? Um, and now, four years later, <laughs> people are much more... <laughs> aware of it right mm. there have been so many incidents in different countries even mm. in different sports where it's like oh wow okay this is actually mm. this happening. is a problem yeah this is happening yeah. this is real yeah this is not something someone made up it's affecting oh you know you have daughters and mm. i have many friends actually at this point i've spoken to several friends who have daughters and their daughters have had to play against another team or something yeah. and they've got literally a boy yeah. you know a boy on their team yeah. right this kind of thing so the rubber's meeting the road and it's actually affecting people in a in a real way and more and more people have gained the courage to speak out against it mm. right people are very f afraid of being labeled people don't want to be labeled racist mm. transphobe mm. far right bigot white supremacist sexist misogynist what what whatever the thing is and so most people bite their tongue right we we hear a lot about cancel culture yeah. right no one wants to be the person who they say something and, um, oh, you know, someone comes to, you know, their employer and tries to get them fired or, yeah. so, or just marginalizes them in this way and this. So there are many, many, many topics out there where people think something 
but they're like, okay, but I, yeah, yeah, but I but I don't want to say it, yeah. right? They're like, okay, this is, you talk to them privately, and they're like, yeah. yeah, of course, you know, males shouldn't be competing with females yeah. in sport. This is absurd. Yeah. But then they won't say it out loud because it's like, oh, I don't want to be called a. But when you and I growing up, there yeah. were two genders. Yeah, there still are. Yeah, yeah, there still are. But there's forty five. <laughs> genders right now i was at a festival the other week and the comedian was on stage oh, really? he's talking about this do you realize it's 45 genders i was like 45 no it's more than that is it more than that is it? <laughs> yeah but look I, I would say look there's two there's two genders and infinite personalities that's mm. there that's the reality that's of a it. lovely way of putting it that, that's infinite that's what it is there's you know what's interesting though but over the last couple of years i've got friends their son and their daughter mm. are talking about again mm. i want to be a boy he's, oh. she's 14 He's 15, wants to be a girl. It's this like, is, where on earth has this come from? But, this, but uh, you know, this is the thing, though, because people are being blindsided from it. I've been talking about this since 2016, mm. right? Very vocally since 2018, 2019. Yeah. But this, it, it hasn't come from nowhere. It's mm. just that people are realizing. But with that realization comes the pushback. Yeah. For People need to be aware that something even exists um, before they can address it. Right. If if in 20, if go back 10 years ago, mm. 2013, if you even talk to people about these ideas, like it didn't even it wouldn't have even course, sounded real. No, I agree. If you told people, OK, these are some of the issues that we're going to be facing in 2020. My mate Dave wants to be Tracy. Yeah. If you said that 10 years ago, you'd be thinking what you're well, about. But, not <laughs> just that, but oh, also he's a, he's a boxer. And now he should be if he says he's Tracy, he should be able to box women. A box women. Yeah. People would have been like, are you, are you mad? Are you mad? Right. There's no, no woman's going to beat a bloke. Yeah. 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 If someone said, you know, do you think a, a, a 12 year old yeah. should be able to, an eight year old should be able to make a permanent decision mm. about, you know, go on hormone, go on hormone therapy yeah. or, you know, have certain surgeries, irreversible surgeries to change, you know, have, do you, do you think, a, do you think, do you think 15 year olds should be having sex change surgery? Like no mm. one would have thought mm. that. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah. It wouldn't even have even been. You know, it wasn't, and then, whoa, you know, yeah. it, it's it's sort of exploded and you've got this social contagion, mm. which actually primarily affects girls more than it does boys. Mm. Girls, are, girls are more sociable and they're, yeah. they tend to be more influenced by some of this, uh, some of these campaigns going on. And so, yeah, I think that it's waking people up. It has woken people up. I've spoken to, I've, I travel so much. Yeah. I've had this conversation with people across the USA, in the UK, when I was in Australia, mm. when I was there. Oh, you know, I get DMs from people mm. like, oh, I've got a 12 year old mm. daughter and like she was she's been watching X and yeah. now she's, you know, asking, you yeah. know, she wants to be referred to this way or she yeah. wants to change her pronouns or this. So as sad as it is, I think it's like, OK, well, this is the realization phase. This is people going, wait, 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 hang on. Like there's yeah. something there's something going on here. You know, when when I was a child, this wasn't happening, yeah. you know, when. So what's happened in the last eight years? Mm. Right. What's happened in the last eight years that all of a sudden thousands, potentially millions of young people are, you know, not, com you know, and so. Or non-binary. It's just it's, it's nonsense, yeah, you know, yeah. and the, and like I said, most people won't just say it's nonsense. Most people will just acquiesce. Yeah. You know, why? why? Because they don't want to be caught up in anything. <sighs> you know, the, the biggest fear of human beings beyond death and perhaps si serious sickness is, um, Fear of, what's the best way to put it? Fear of uh, social disapproval. Social disapproval, yeah. Yeah, fear of social disapproval. So if you're in a room, and and they've done tests on like mm. this, you know, like the ASH experiment. Mm. If you're in a room with, uh, you know, 50 people, and they're asking everyone, what does two plus two equal? Mm. And they're going down the line. And it's like five five mm. five five mm. and then it gets to you a lot of people are afraid to f say four yeah right mm. it, it's 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 safer short term mm. to say five it's like well mm. everyone else said in your brain you might even be like i'm pretty it's sure it's on. On. Yeah. Pretty, pretty sure pretty sure it's four but every, <laughs> yeah. everyone else is saying it's five yeah um you know i think the ash experiment that's the one where they drew the lines yeah. and they say you know which line is longer and the person who's being tested doesn't know everyone else is an actor and you know they're saying that the mm. the shorter line is longer, mm. and most people will say that the shorter line is longer if everyone else does, mm. right? So human beings, we're you know if you're just in a room and there's fifty people, and everyone's wearing white and you're in green, most people don't feel comfortable with that. Mm. I'd be okay. 
because mm. I don't. Same. I, I have. I have. Yeah. <laughs> Same, yeah. Yeah. But but I I would wager that um. I don't know if you've ever done a personality test, but I, I would imagine you are actually would turn out to be quite a disagreeable mm. person, right? Um, you'd be on the lower end of agreeableness, which doesn't mean you're you know not a kind person or whatever, mm. but it means that you care less about that dimension. Yeah. You know, you'd rather be right than be in the majority, yeah. right? Most people would rather be in the majority yeah. than be right. Mm. Um, we actually saw this massively play out. I don't even like to talk about it, but we saw this massively play out with the whole mask situation and even the VAC situation mm. in 2020 mm. and 2021, right? If everyone's wearing a mask and you're not, people don't feel people comfortable don't yeah. with that. Do you, know, do you know the biggest predictor of mask compliance is how many, <laughs> I saw something about this, and it doesn't surprise me at all, is actually how many other people are wearing them, Yeah. right? So if everyone else, if there's like a 99% compliance rate, then being the 1%, that's not doing it feels awkward, mm. right? And it can also go in the reverse, mm. right? If someone's if someone's like the one person wearing one, and everyone else is there and like you know kind of looking at them mm. weird. They're like, oh, okay, like it. So th I think that's actually where where it where it comes from. So the fear of social disapproval, um, you know, people don't number one, people don't want to be canceled, but yeah. people people don't want to be called names. People don't want to be uh, they just rather thought have an of easy to, life, not speak up, take the yeah, easy life. It's easier. Yeah, it, it really in in. The, the the funny thing is in the short term in the long term it causes much more pain, mm. but in the short term it's easier to just play get go along to get along. And the truth is, look, if you're going to be a functional human in a social society, there's always going to be times where you know you you moderate and calibrate yourself, mm. right? In every single situation at all times, you don't say absolutely everything that's on your mind, yeah. right? You don't always, yeah. uh, uh, you just keep, you hold some yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. like, like yeah, always, yeah. right? We bite our tongue sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we think something, but you know, it's not, it, it wouldn't be wise yeah. to, to say something. And so we all do this dance and equation a little bit in our brain to, at various points. Mm. But if you go, if you go too far to the cowardly side mm. or the biting your tongue side or the never rocking the boat side, um, you can kind of become you. You can become enslaved by that. I agree, right? You, you, Live you in regret. Yes, you, you, you become yeah. a coward, and also it means that people can like force things upon yeah. you. People can like push things upon you, and instead of saying like, "Wait, wait, hang on," actually, I have a disagreement, mm. right? Um, I don't believe in that. Yeah, you no, no, no. That. I, I, I don't think two plus mm. two equals five. I actually, mm. yes, I do think that all ninety nine of you are wrong. Yeah, I do think here's two plus two equals four. Here's yeah. why I think it equals four, yeah. right? Um. And so most people won't do that. So if someone comes out and says, hey, you know, I'm I'm non-binary, call me a they, them. Most people would just be like, okay, cool, right? Yeah. Most people won't go, wait, like, I mean, my first question would be like, what do you mean? Yeah, same. What do you mean? Like, what, what, what does that mean? Yeah, what does, yeah. What, what does that mean? Yeah. Like... You know, yeah, like same. it's it's a very basic question. I mean, like, what what is that? When when someone says, "Hey, you know, if I come and I say, you know, I I identify as a woman," it's like, well, I'll I'll tell you because people always miss when this really went the catalyst for this really going mainstream. It was Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah, it was Caitlyn Jenner when Bruce Jenner came out and said, "You know, I'm Caitlyn and I'm a woman and everything." Um, did that allow and, for everyone to go? I can do well, that. Well, did did anyone go? Wait, hang on a minute. Mm. Like what? What do you mean? Mm. Like, we, this is someone who's sixty something years old, yeah. former athlete. You've, athlete, you've literally yeah. got medals yeah. as a man. You've got a family, you have children. Mm. You know, I think a fair, very fair question is like, what would you mean? Mm. Like, when you say you feel like a woman, you've never been a woman. How? How for sixty years? Yeah, like, I don't. How can I? I? Don't. I've never been a woman, and never will be a woman in a day in my life. Mm. Not really. Oh, so like. When when I if I say I feel like a woman, what does that even what does that mean? Yeah, like that's a very fair immediate question. Like yeah. what what do you mean? It, let alone you're saying, well, I'm I'm neither. Yeah, right. I feel not a man nor a woman. You know, I'm I'm neither. Yeah, it's like well, what what does that mean? what does that yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah, 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 you know. Yeah, like, but people won't even do that first step. Instead, it's just like immediately embrace, mm. affirm, even celebrate. Mm. I mean, Bruce Jenner won Woman of the Year, mm. despite not being a woman for a year. And how do you feel about it? You see, like Bruce Jenner, are you just like, good luck to you? It's your world. Because my, uh, like, my attitude is good luck to you. It's not affecting sure, me. Dude, crack on. I, I, I'm with, with this stuff. Like I generally, it, it's funny because, you know, it, I talk about it a lot and mm. I get asked about it a lot. So I think. Do you get any neg for talking about it? Of course, it? man. Of course. You do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I jump, I jump, are you cool with that? I'm fine, man. I, I jump on landmines all day. It's yeah. all good. 
Um, <laughs> and one reason, I, one, one, one reason I do it is actually to clear the field for other people. Yeah, okay. Right? Because I know that by me speaking up and no. saying some of these things, it opens the Overton window a tiny bit so, so other, other people, people, can come, other yeah. people know, okay, like you can jump on that landmine and it's not actually going to yeah. destroy you. Yeah. Um, so look, my, my general view with the vast majority of things is like, I don't, like, I'm really not that involved in other people's lives. Like, I don't, mm. I don't really care. There are things that I think are, you know, right or wrong or make sense mm. or don't or whatever. But I typically, I generally don't care. And this is actually the position that most people, at least in the Western world, um, have had until they forced people to care. Mm. As soon as you start saying, okay, so we're going to start putting men in women's sports. Yeah. Okay, you're forcing people to care. Yeah. Okay, I'm, we're going to start you know, putting a naked man can now go into the changing room yeah. that your daughter is getting changed. Ooh, ooh, okay. Wait, yeah. okay. We're now going to start teaching your children yeah. about stuff that you, that is false and you don't agree. You're forcing people to care. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, like okay. most people don't care. Well, no, or, or that guy's going into a female prison. He, exactly. But he was a rapist. Exactly. He's now identifying as a woman going yeah. to female prison. What exactly. What earth is going on there? Yeah. You're forcing people to care. If someone's saying that you must, you must refer to me as, you know, by these pronouns. Yeah. I want I want you to call me ZZM. Yeah. You're forcing people to care. Yeah. Right? Because you might be like, well, no, I'm not calling you that. Yeah. Like, you don't just get your own pronouns. That's not how language works. Mm. Just like we don't get our own adjectives. Mm. Right? I might say, I want you to call me, you know, great, handsome, and smart Zuby. Mm. But, like, you don't have to. If, if I'm going around insisting that everyone calls me great, smart, and handsome, and they're refusing to, um, that's a me problem. Right. Like I'm not entitled to a certain adjectives. Right. Like it's you, you don't just get your own language that way. You have your name. Mm. Right. And that, and that and that's it. So this is the problem. You know, they, they forced so many people to care by pushing it to such an yeah. such an extreme but, you level. Know, I think it goes to a snowball effect. These things that happen, snowball effect, mm. before you know, it's, it's integrated into our society. Well, that's what's happened, which yeah. is why so many people are looking up now and going, wait, how did we get here? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like I said, there is there is the pushback and the will be successful mm. and i think primarily for two reasons and it might, might take a while number one is because the truth wins in the end mm. right when you have something that is built on a, a genuine falsehood right if someone is out there saying you know uh you know men men can get pregnant or you know men and you know men can compete on equal footing with women in yeah. sport reality does exist mm. And so you can deny reality, but you can't deny the consequences of But men reality. can't get pregnant. No. But will the, will men be able to get pregnant one day? No. Right. No, because I'm get pregnant. Like, that's and, what, and that's so, what I'm... That's... And, 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 and so the, the, the absurdity of it all, but then also it's like... How do we know that? How do we know that one day men can't get pregnant? The way the world is moving so fast. Is there any way? No, well, look, I mean... You... We don't know. No. No, we no, we do know. know. We do know. I think we know. It's biologically yeah. impossible. Okay, it's biologically look, impossible. Is there okay? How many human beings have ever worked, walked the earth? Well, we, we, I don't even know the number. What would we estimate? Twelve billion? Yeah, I'll say double what we've got now. Seven billion on Earth now. Maybe double. Yeah, maybe yeah. twelve. Yeah. Let's say let's yeah, say yeah. let's say twelve billion people have ever yeah. walked the earth. Uh, how many were birth birth from men? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> How many were birthed from women? Yeah. Oh, look, that's my, yeah, it's yeah, crazy. So, isn't it? so, you know, and, and this goes this the, the crazy this goes beyond even the the human kingdom, mm. right? This this is all animal, animal species. Kingdom. It goes like on the for everything. The female by definition mm. or like females are the ones that get pregnant. And the, but it the, does the, make me think the, the way is, the world is going so quick, what if right, one look, you, day you, you can try to do some Frankenstein yeah. experiment on someone and you know take a womb from a female cadaver and try yeah. to put it into a man and like Gosh, like good luck. Good luck to you. <laughs> what, what are you going to birth? What are you yeah. going to birth through? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like even thinking about it makes me kind of like <laughs> yeah. grossed out, you know. And, and it's also like this is the thing as well. The the thing it's what's so crazy. So much of this is, I often just come back to like, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Mm. Like when people are like pushing all this stuff and this is like, is it? Since when is it a problem that men don't get pregnant? Yeah. <laughs> Do you see what yeah, I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, what are we trying to fix? Yeah. Like, we have all these actual problems, and we're, we're people like running down all these directions, and I'm just like, why? Like, what are we doing? Zuby, we could speak for hours <laughs> and hours. This is the longest podcast I have ever done. Really? And we're two hours forty three minutes. 
Oh, wow. And I am loving it. Joe Rogan style. I am loving this. We've got so many stuff. <laughs> this is all freestyle. Nothing's been thought. Yeah. Two fellas having a chat about life and the world. Yeah, man. Just before we finish up here, tell me how you got banned from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and what did it make you feel knowing you built up this huge fan base? Did it give you the fear at all when you saw you got banned? Um, so the ban was back in, that was 20, 2021, early 2021. Mm. It was just, it was a temporary suspension. What happened? Did it bam. Um, yeah. What did so, you see on your phone? Oh, um, I got an email from okay. Twitter saying that my account had been locked. And it said, um, I can show you the email later. It, um... It said um, under the hateful conduct policy, mm. and then there was you know was a description saying you know you cannot attack, threaten, or harass people based on their race, their gender, their sexuality, religion, dis uh, disability, so on and so forth. And I'm like I'm 99.9% mm. certain I don't do that and mm. have never done that. And then it said um, you know this is the tweet which violated our policy. <laughs> what would you say? Okay, dude. That was it. So you just put okay, dude. Okay, dude. Dot, dot, dot. That was it. And I was actually, I was actually confused because the tweet it was relating to was from about a week prior. Do you um, do a track called OK Dude? Yeah, that's why. That's why. That's why. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. The full story is I had a, I had a, I, I have a lot of viral tweets. I had a tweet that was going viral, which was, uh, I think it was called like, um, advice for single women on how to get a great guy. And uh, it was like four very simple bullet points. It was like, uh, I think it was like, I think it was like, be sweet, uh, be in good shape, grow your hair long, learn how to cook and don't be annoying. Um, <laughs> and so this list was going, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this, I stand by it, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. But this list was going viral, right? Like people were, you know how people are yeah. on the internet. So, yeah. so, some people are loving it. Some yeah. people are like, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. like attacking you, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and someone had just responded to it saying something like, uh, oh, this is terrible advice and I bet I sleep with more women than you do. Yeah. And I just said, okay, dude. And that was it. And, left and then like a week later, I get this email from Twitter saying that my uh, account has been temporarily suspended mm. and that was the offending tweet. Okay, dude. Mm. That was lit. That was lit. It said, yeah. I, I get people like, oh, come on. Surely you said How something else. How long did else. they ban you for? Um, it ended up being about 72 hours, but I had to delete the tweet. Okay. So I appealed it first because I was like, surely this is a mistake. Mm. You didn't really just ban me. Mm. Like of all the hundreds of thousands of tweets mm. I've put out there, I put out some spicy ones. Mm. And the thing that <laughs> the thing that's over the yeah. edge is OK, hey, dude. dude. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I actually appealed it because I thought maybe like they got it wrong. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe yeah. like an algorithm caught mm. it or something. I was like, surely not. And then they upheld it. You know, I got manually reviewed and they said, no, this, you know, this violates our hateful mm. conduct policy. And so. I uh, I actually went and made a T-shirt that said OK Dude on it. And um, I did want to get my Twitter back. I think I had about a quarter million followers at the time. Mm. So I uh, the first tweet I put back up was me dancing with this shirt that just said OK Dude on it. And people were like, I want that T-shirt. I, I want that T-shirt. So I, I sold 300 that weekend. Did you quality? <laughs> so I sold 300 <laughs> that weekend. I made a song about it with a music video. It's actually my most listened to song now. Brilliant. <laughs> so actually I ended end up making tens of thousands of pounds from OK Dude. I did OK Dude hats. Thank you. OK thank Dude t-shirt. Thank you, Twitter. Yeah. So um, thank you, Twitter. Silver and, lining. And then, yeah. What are your thoughts on Twitter versus Threads? Do you think Threads will take no, off? No. No, Twitter's got this. You reckon? Twitter's got this. Are you this. on Threads? Um, yeah, but I think they've already censored me. Like my profile photo doesn't even show up. Right, okay. Yeah. But um, nah, Twitter's got this, man. Like, there's no, nah, Twitter, Twitter's, Facebook needs to stay in their lane on this one. I you think, reckon? yeah, I, 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 there's no appeal. Like, Twitter. Do you reckon Elon's worried no. about Twitter? No, because Twitter's just Twitter is getting Twitter is so much better now than it was a year ago. Okay. It's just getting better and better. They've just started monetizing creators. Yeah. You've got subscriptions turned on. You've now got long form videos, full podcasts yeah. on Twitter. Like it's gonna keep on getting better, and I know his plans. Like he talked about his plans for Twitter. Like he wants to turn, he want you know he wants to turn it into X. Mm. So he wants Twitter to morph into X, the everything app. He wants he wants a, he wants he said on my podcast that he wants fifty percent of global transactions to run through X. Is that right? So he like 
his uh, his his, his goal yeah, is yeah the, okay. the, the the vision is massive and even just using twitter as someone who's been using again yeah. i've been on it for 14 years do you enjoy it is it one of your favorites i love twitter yeah which is your by which far, is your favorite by far i could easily not have the rest like right, just okay. give me just give me twitter i'm fine um because Twitter's the only one I don't like. Really? Oh, man. I do all the other ones and it's great, but uh, Twitter's no. the one I look at. <laughs> oh, really? How do you build out? Do you build a. If you just got to invest a lot of time as you do on other apps to build your Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, How do you go viral on Twitter? How do you. It's the easiest platform to go viral. Is it? Maybe maybe TikTok, but I don't use TikTok. So see, see, TikTok's TikTok, the one I don't we've use. We've gone viral. We had 80 yeah. million views in the past six months for <laughs> yeah. across the, nothing on Twitter because we haven't really. Twitter is the easiest to go viral, like fully organically, like based off of your support. Because Twitter has the repeat, retweet button. So if you post something, I can just retweet it, right? So if I post something tonight, a photo of me and you, and you retweet it, will people start following me? Yeah, of course. They'll be like, hey, you're friends with Zuby. I want to follow you. <laughs> right, we're on. Yeah. <laughs> we start our Twitter journey. Get rid of threads. <laughs> no, but, but tw Twitter, honestly, in terms of what it's, when we use, use the term social network, I think by far, and I've thought this for years, I think Twitter is the best social network by far yeah. in terms of actually being a social network, yeah. right? Facebook, perhaps there was a time yeah. when it was. Um, Instagram, no. Yeah. YouTube, no. Yeah. TikTok, no. Like, like in terms of actually think of what social network means, yeah. like connecting Con people okay. and communicating and sharing ideas mm. and linking. Like Twitter is a... Okay. And my, you're getting paid from it because I'm I'm yeah. enjoying getting paid from YouTube. Sure, that's a nice each month coming through. Yeah, and it's only growing and growing and growing mm -hmm. due to the podcast and everything else. Yeah, ironically, I mean, I earn more through Twitter than I do any other social media. Well, okay, by miles. Yeah, by miles, and that's before they that's before it was monetized. Yeah, like I've earned hundreds of thousands mm. through Twitter. Most people didn't even the idea that you can even earn money on Twitter. It, like now, it's it's like officially monetized. But Twitter has been monetized for the past decade. Do you think we're too late to the party for Twitter? No. Do you no. think I've got enough to say to make Twitter work? Absolutely. 100%. And I'm not, so I have no stock in Twitter. No, <laughs> not, no, no, no. But it's like, nice it's, to hear. It's such a, like all this, all the stuff we've been describing mm. wouldn't have happened without Twitter. Mm. White House, Pentagon, Joe Rogan, Elon, like all of that was through Twitter. It wasn't Instagram. It wasn't YouTube. It wasn't Facebook. It was all through Twitter. What would you suggest doing? Uh, what would you suggest doing for someone to grow their following on Twitter? You don't have to have a lot of following to go viral, do you? Uh, no, you. But you do need you do need people to amplify you. Okay. Right. You and know, that the share button. Yeah, the retweet button. Retweet button. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're not being amplified, then there's no organic way okay. for you to go viral. It's not like TikTok where you get shoved into an algorithm and your stuff is mm. fed to different people. Do or you reckon if YouTube. I gave you my Twitter account, you could write something knowing that this could go viral. Yeah, of course, but I wouldn't. You wouldn't? No, I only tweet for me. Mm. <laughs> but I could, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, I've been on the platform. You can give for... me the heads up. You ain't got to do it. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll type it. You just give me the heads up of what's going on in that yeah. Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think twi Twitter is the most uh, underappreciated. And it's been like this forever. That's yeah, okay. the crazy thing. Like, okay. one thing I love about it, because Twitter has fewer monthly users than all the others. All right, TikTok is a billion people a yeah. month. Facebook is a month. Mm. Instagram is a billion people a month. What's Twitter? Twitter, I believe, is about 400 million. Okay, wow. Well. Might be approaching half And have you now. found that Twitter opens every single door for you? Yes. So any door you want to open, you can go and DM, you can direct message anyone. I, it's easier to reach people on Twitter than on any other network. My God. If you try to reach, even if someone tries to reach me on Instagram, it's pretty hard. Why? Because you won't see it. It's won't see, like it. The they won't even get put into my main inbox. It'll yeah. get lost in. Same. It'll just get buried. Yeah, in, that's what I'm finding. Yeah. yeah, it just gets buried in everything else. Like on Twitter, like I mean, I'm, this is not a call for everyone to yeah. start spamming me with DMs. But like, I'm very easy to reach. So are politicians. So are athletes. So are celebrities. So why? Are, what's the difference? So is the CEO of Twitter. What's the difference of getting through to someone on a DM and Twitter versus Instagram? How do you not? How do you lose it in Instagram, but actually? Don't lose it in Twitter. Is uh, it laid out differently? Yeah, it's laid out differently. Okay. It's laid out differently. But even without the DMs, even just in mentions, mm. it's easier to reach people because it's like a it's a real time platform. And also because people are just, you know, Twitter is it's it's text based. Yeah. So people are sharing their Mind. thoughts and ideas. Yeah, okay. It's not just like, hey, here's a pretty photo of me. Hey, here's me doing something cool. Yeah. Hey, here's me, you know, Instagram's like a highlight reel. Yeah. Um 
Twitter is just, it's, it's the daily conversation. It's mm. like, what are people talking about? It could be any, whatever topic you're interested in, mm. it's, it's going on there, right? There's a sports match going, you know, the, when the World Cup was happening, Up Twitter was just okay. like, like it was going crazy, right? Like it's just real time from all around the world and people are discussing the games and this player and that. Say if you've got a good following on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, mm. but I don't use Twitter. Sure. But I want to reach out to people and send them a DM, but they look and go, oh, he's only got a thousand on Twitter. He doesn't really use Twitter. Is he the real deal? Mm -hmm. That's that's always could be a problem. Yeah, it can, you know, but you start from zero on every platform. Yeah. And, you know, my Twitter following is big. Like all my platforms are big now. Yeah. But my Twitter is still the biggest, biggest, big, biggest by quite a long way. Yeah. OK. I mean, my Twitter is over one point one million. Yeah. My second biggest is Instagram, With which is three hundred ninety two thousand yeah. at this point. Um, I mean, that's a threefold difference. Yeah. Right. And then after that, YouTube is, I think about 230, 200, yeah. 230, Facebook's about 160. Um, so, you know, they're all big, they're all mm. well over a hundred thousand, you know, they're all hundreds, mm. hundreds of thousands, but, but Twitter's your go-to. Twitter's the, you know, it's the big one. And also those Twitter followers are more valuable in many aspects than the, than the other ones. Okay. Um, just due to the nature of the platform. And one thing with Twitter is like one, one of the biggest issues with like Facebook and Instagram is just the meta platforms is as you would have experienced, they're always changing the algorithm yeah. Yeah. and slowing you, people down, not what, as big a reach as you used to get. Exactly. Yeah, 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 you would have seen this even with yeah. your, you know, Bournemouth festival mm. page or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you're, you, you're, not, you're trying to reach your own people. And they're, and they're not, you. they're not, yeah. yeah. And you're not seeing your stuff. And maybe now you have to shell out, you know, thousands yeah. of pounds. And you say in Twitter, own... they, 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 there's none no, of that. None of that. I've never, I've never, I've never paid any, I got, I've never invested any money mm. to grow mm. my following. It's all Why organic. do you think Twitter will beat threads all day long? Well, they've got a 15 year head start. Yeah. Um, threads does not offer anything. Okay. Offers is literally. Do you not think it offers the people who don't understand Twitter who are on Instagram to go? It's the exactly well, Instagram the same. could do a nice one. For they you. literally just copy Twitter. It's exactly the same. Yeah, but worse. Yeah, like there's no there's no advantage Threads has over Twitter, mm. apart from the fact that like some people don't like Elon and will want to use Threads yeah, to okay. like. But then you just get a little echo chamber over there. But yeah. uh, all the real OGs are. All the real OGs are staying okay. on Twitter. <laughs> Zuby, man, yeah. we're coming up to three hours. Man, I could a... speak for another two, three hours on all sorts of subjects. We'll have to do a proper part two, mate, when you're back in the country. No doubt, man. Time. It's been a pleasure, man. It's been I've been really enjoyed pleasure, it. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Nice topics. No doubt, man. You're a good man. I appreciate it, brother. Nice Thank one. You. And you, man. Take care.